My Little Pony is a show that needs no introduction. Although it's based on a franchise that's existed since the early 80s, arguably its peak in popularity was in the early to mid 2010s with Friendship is Magic. Whether for better or for worse, it's left its mark on popular culture. The adventures of Twilight, Sparkle, and Friends have crossed generational boundaries, appealing to both children and other demographics. This appeal seemed to fade throughout the decade, but even with that, it's nearly a 10 year run if you count spin-offs and the fact that the next generation wouldn't be introduced until the beginning of the next decade. In total, there are 222 episodes, which might I add is a pretty neat even number, and I've watched all of them in order to give my thoughts and yes, rank every episode of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. You know, somebody had to do it, and it was gonna be me, come on, you, you, know, you think LS Mark was gonna do it? Get out of here. The animated James look and redesign. This is actually a video I've wanted to make for a long time, and I assume it's gonna take a long time to come out and be long itself. So grab a snack and listen to this in the background while you work or play a game, because we're just gonna jump straight into it. Here we are, the first ever episode. This medieval manuscript intro with the backstory, cutting to Twilight, reading the book, it's absolutely iconic, dude. Put this next to the opening of like 2001 A Space Odyssey as like the most iconic intro to anything ever. Kubrick wished he could direct like this. But for real though, from the start you can see the distinct visual style which I'm really digging. Lauren Faust and the gang did such a good job on the art direction. The backgrounds are also whimsical and filled with the swoopy like Dr. Seuss architecture. Everything has these little swirls on it. It really does look like a storybook. It's a style that, from what I can imagine, is pretty appealing to kids, but without being like super saturated or sparkly or whatever. That's something people really don't talk about with FIM is how stylish everything is, at least early on. Twilight Sparkle is a unicorn who's too obsessed with her studies to make friends, so the princess sends her to make some in the small town of Ponyville. There's also this prophecy that an evil pony called Nightmare Moon will come and wreak havoc on Equestria, so she also tries to find something to stop it while she's there. We're introduced to all the main ponies. Twilight, the main six, even Spike is here, and Derpy, the classic character. Also a surprising amount of world building about the show's locations and characters, like, they set everything up, even the relationships between, like, the certain ponies. You can definitely tell that the show is rough around the edges in this first episode. Some of the character voices sound a little off, and this music that we never hear in the rest of the show when Twilight's running here sounds like... It reminds me of like Wow Wow Wubsy. I know I've heard of the elements of harmony. Like, I don't know, you can feel the 2000s kind of fading away into the 2010s. Like, look at these gradients, these Adobe Flash gradients, man. They don't make them like they used to. Overall, this episode does a nice job setting everything up. Characters, animation style, tone, overall it's cute. It's just a cute show. Nightmare Moon finally shows up, so Twilight goes out to the nearby Everfree Forest to find the Elements of Harmony, which are the only things that can defeat her. Turns out that the main six ponies are the embodiments of the elements, and throughout the episode, we see them using their respective element to get past all Nightmare Moon's little traps. Applejack is honest, Rarity is generous, Fluttershy kind, Rainbow Dash is loyal, Pinkie Pie is laughter, and once they confront Nightmare Moon, we find out that Twilight is the element of magic. You know, all things that go into a good friendship, including magic. The adventure that they go on here is fun and engaging, and we get some more stylish backgrounds and character designs. Them going on a little scary adventure feels a lot like the 80s My Little Pony, but obviously everything is different and updated. Big difference between that and this is that Friendship is Magic is more character focused, since that's what kids want today. You sell them characters, you don't sell them, sell them toys, it's gotta be characters. You know, in fact, that's why Lauren was involved the way she was, because they wanted something that emphasized characters first before gimmicks and playsets. You know, that's not to say they didn't start out with the gimmicks and the playsets, but they really wanted something that people could get attached to. Pinkie Pie gets her first song in it, which is a pretty good jam. Not my favorite by far, but it's a staple, you know. You can tell this is early in the show too, there are so many little off-model faces that they use. Don't get used to those, except for when they bring them back in Season 8. The main six discover the elements of harmony and defeat Nightmare Moon, who turns out to be Princess Luna. <gasps> wow, dude, actually, um, that was kind of obvious and minus 100 points. This is going at the bottom. But for real though, it's a nice end to the two-parter and sets up pretty much the whole show. <laughs> 
The Ticketmaster counts as a pilot in and of itself. All the main six get roped into the story when Twilight gets two tickets to the Grand Galloping Gala and needs to decide which friend to take. This results in all her friends bending over backwards to get on her good side. It's a good showcase of the main six and their dynamic. While it is a pretty stock, like, sitcom plot, it's a good way to get you acquainted with the characters. Sorry for still being impressed by the backgrounds, but here they really are so fun, especially in these little fantasy sequences. The gala here looks nothing like it does later on, plus Granny Smith is a little... erm... Um... Another season 1 quirk I want to mention is Twilight's personality. She has this edge to her that slowly goes away over the course of the show. You can say that's her growing as a character, but I like the idea of Twilight being a little grumpy and having that snarky side to her. Ticketmaster is a great third episode for what it needs to be. Season 1 is weird, dude. Big Mac is talking in actual sentences here, and it isn't for a gag. Biting off more than you can chew is just what I'm afraid of. With him out of commission, Applejack needs to harvest all the apples on her family's farm. With all the work she's doing, she eventually burns herself out and isn't able to help her friends with anything. It ends with her learning a lesson about accepting help from others. A lot of firsts in this episode. Besides Big Mac, we get the first look at Sugar Cube Corner, Derpy liking muffins, these random flower ponies, the race is a mule, and need I forget, not a first, but not baked goods, baked dads. How are we feeling about this Photoshop gradient bowl? Fun fact, it was originally going to be called Apple Bonking instead of Bucking like she does in the show. I think it's a good message, but not entirely applicable to little kids. Not to go all brony, but this is really an episode that speaks to an older audience. I'm pretty sure all of you out there have gotten burned out on something before. Instead of Apple Buck season for me, it was the G1 Iceberg. I think I like it a little more than Ticketmaster, because we get to focus on a character who isn't Twilight for the first time, but they're on pretty equal ground. <laughs> This episode starts with Pinky being really clingy, but you know what? It's justified. Rainbow's old friend Gilda the Griffin shows up in Ponyville and is an absolute female dog. She keeps pulling pranks on people until she gets pranked herself, and apparently can't take it. I originally thought the story was about being jealous of your friends having other friends, but it turns out the moral is about, like, taking a joke. But then Rainbow Dash says something about choosing good people to be your friends. I see what they're going for, but the way everything's set up is a little confused. I like Rainbow and Pinkie Pie hanging out, and Pinkie Pie being silly but knowing when to dial it back. At the end of the day, it's about being nice. Because of the weird choice of message, I'm gonna put it a little lower than the others for now, but it's still okay. I like Gri- I like Gilda's- I like Gilda's- I like the design that they give the, the Griffin. <laughs> Ghostbusters, like last time, is about another character who comes to town and messes with people. This unicorn calling herself the great and powerful Trixie says that she can beat the main six at everything. Twilight, not wanting to show off the way that Trixie does, doesn't even try and challenge her. It ends with the Ursa Minor wreaking havoc on the town and Trixie getting dethroned by Twilight, when she uses magic to drive the thing away. Trixie is a really fun character and a nice foil to Twilight. I was always under the impression that she really couldn't do magic, but here she's at least competent, which is weird. She makes Rainbow Dash go all crazy and all that. There's this weird part in the beginning where Trixie shows up for the first time and just says she can do magic kind of good, and all the main six are immediately on her case for like no reason. I get that's what they need to do for Twilight to be insecure to have the ending, but dude, god forbid you say you're good at anything in Ponyville. These people will chew you up and spit you out. First appearance of Snips and Snails here. People never bring this up, but Snips has the same voice actor as Bling Bling Boy from Johnny Test, and it's the exact same voice. Yeah, they say that she's got more magical powers than any other unicorn ever! Also, one of the sisters from Johnny Test was voiced by Rainbow Dash. Ghostbusters is a fun episode. It's got a nice message about having talent with kind of a boy who cried wolf story. <laughs> This is me saying no we can't to the Bob the Builder theme song. The main six have to go up a mountain and stop a dragon from raining smoke down on Equestria. But uh oh, Fluttershy's scared of dragons. Erm, even though she thinks Spike is cute, okay, plot holes, you're out of 10 episode. It's another big adventure for the main six, with trials, tribulations, and some more Adobe Flash gradients. 
Fluttershy gets scared of everything on the journey, but eventually manages to toughen up when her friends are in danger. This is a fun little adventure, and I like seeing the main six in the setting. They all have something to contribute to the story, and the moral is pretty clear-cut. Rainbow Dash is not having it with Fluttershy and just wants to get rid of the dragon, which adds to the group's dynamic. This adventure stuff was originally going to be a bigger part of the show, with the subtitle for the Pitch Bible being My Little Pony Adventures. Now this episode is a My Little Pony Adventure, if I ever did see one. This is our first Rarity and Applejack episode, and what a good time! This one is so cozy, if you watch MLP or anything as a comfort show, this is THE episode. The two get stuck inside during a storm, and Twilight tries to have a proper by-the-book sleepover. It's kinda like that one Spongebob episode where he has the party and there's the list of activities he makes everyone do, but instead of getting kicked out, we have romantic tension between the other guests. The setting of being inside during a rainstorm just gives everything a certain vibe, and it's such a small-scale story, it works really well to get everything done with the two, three characters. The number one complaint I hear about this episode is that Twilight is too oblivious to the other two fighting, but she's only like that because she's excited about a book. You know, those things that she... she likes. Plus, it's been established she never had any friends, so the allure of having a sleepover probably is too much for her. This is probably my favorite so far, it's just a cute episode, you know, just a gay old time. Ah, finally, the racism episode. Also, the first time Apple Bloom gets a speaking role. Besides the pilot, ugh. A mysterious zebra named Zakora comes to town. Everyone's scared of her because they think she's some kind of evil witch, but it turns out she just makes, like, potions in her little cottage. The day after she comes to town, all the main six have wacky magic stuff happening to them, and immediately they blame her, but turns out it was all a big misunderstanding. A pretty obvious moral, but it's nothing worth getting mad about. Voice of Reason from 2013. Why? Why in all of Tartarus does bridal gossip get a pass? Please, someone enlighten me to why this atrocity is considered a good episode. They really beat it into you how much they're messing around in those blue flowers before they get all cursed. Like, I never noticed that as a kid. The curses themselves are okay, Twilight's is foul, though. I have no idea how they were able to show that on television. It's a general story about not being prejudiced, but given how Zakora is obviously coded as an African character, it makes the main six look like horrible, awful racists if you watch this in like a modern context. Zakora is a nice character who I wish they did more with, the rhyming speech thing is fun, and I really wish they showed more zebras in the actual show and not the comics. I will never forgive the comics, dude, what, what is this? These little bugs called the Paris Sprites show up in Ponyville. They're kinda like gremlins in that they start out cute but then multiply and destroy everything in town. So the main six have that on their plate but uh oh, the princess is coming to town. Unlike the episodes so far, there's no little friendship lesson at the end, it's really tacked on. Pinkie Pie has this running joke where she runs around collecting instruments to Pied Piper the creatures out of town. I always forget that Rainbow Dash is like an actual horse. What? <laughs> I always forget that Rainbow Dash has like an actual house in these early episodes. I assume it was something they added in like season 5, it's weird. I made the Gremlins comparison, but it really does feel like one of those monster movies, with the main six trying different things to get the Paris sprites out of their hair, and things getting worse and worse and worse. The episode ends with an impromptu friendship lesson about how they should have trusted Pinkie Pie. You know what, even if there wasn't a heavy emphasis on the moral, it's still fun. I need to stop using the word fun. It's an interesting, it's an engaging story. Alright every brony, time for a My Little Pony lore lesson. In the world of Equestria, it's up to the Pegasus ponies to control the weather. Clouds, rain, snow, rainbows, uh oh, but not for real. In Ponyville, it's different, where every type of pony needs to clean up winter to make way for springtime. It's just such a creative idea. Might be a little heavy to understand, but don't worry, they explain it to you with a banger song. We've had some little ditties from Pinkie Pie earlier in the season, but this is our first real big musical number. And it really shows they're capable with this kind of thing. It's a great time. Back to the whole wrap-up thing, it's handled in an interesting way. 
Twilight as a unicorn new to town doesn't really know where she fits in and spends the episode going around trying to help other ponies. She fails at everything else, but realizes that she's got her own set of skills to contribute. The time of year this takes place in is really unique for the show too. We get a lot of holiday episodes, but no like winter episodes. I always kind of associated MLP with the late winter, early spring where everything's all muddy and maybe it's because of when I first got into it or maybe this episode, I really don't know. It's great looking, but I think it would have looked a little better if they'd done away with the weird yellow sky in this one. Again, a more like grayish blue or teal, like how it is near the end would have been really, really pretty. You really feel for Twilight here. Her little existential crisis is pretty relatable. Spike is good too, probably my favorite character going into this rewatch. Throughout the whole thing, he's this little devil on Twilight's shoulder, like dude does not want to be there. He eventually comes around and everything wraps up nicely. One of my faves so far. World building on top of world building in this next one. Apple Bloom is worried that she won't get her cutie mark by the time Diamond Tiara has a cute Zanira. Get it? So she goes around trying to find out what her special talent is, all for the sake of a bub mark. Very clever of them to have a literal teacher describe the concept of cutie marks in the beginning. I like the parts where Apple Bloom is really overzealous about doing all the different things. The scene where she tries to sell apples is classic. It reminds me of Chowder from Cartoon Network, kinda. An okay song from Pinkie Pie here, but come on, it's no Pinkie's Brew, am I right? At the end of the episode, Apple Bloom meets the other two Crusaders and they set up their club. There's some message about being yourself and the end. Yeah, seasonal episodes. Listen, I love me a good seasonal episode. Applejack and Rainbow Dash have a contest to determine who's the better at athletic stuff. It starts off with the Iron Pony competition, you know, obviously ripped off from Knuckles vs. Applejack, but you know, I'm not gonna judge, I'm not gonna judge. But after Rainbow cheats and uses her wings, they give her a handicap and compete in a race to settle the score. This one's just really cute. The fall setting with all the orange and the leaves coming down is so nice. Twilight coming in at the end and being the one who beats both of them is a really nice touch. It's a cute little love story with a nice hook. That was a joke, you guys. I know it's blah 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 blah. Rarity being the generous one insists on making dresses for all her friends to wear to the Grand Galloping Gala. After she reveals them though, her friends keep making her change the designs to the point where they're just really ugly. This is what I imagine it's like doing like adult commissions. Erm, um, can you make her chest 20% bigger? Couldn't be me though, couldn't be me. The song she sings in this one is excellent. I didn't like it as a kid because it was about making dresses and that was dumb or whatever, but no, it's really fun and the sequence is creative as well. They even do a good job when they do the little reprise of it. Where in the beginning everything's nice and clean and then at the end when they do the second one, her room is all messy. You can see it's like poetry, they rhyme. It has a nice lesson about being grateful, and this is also the first appearance of Vinyl Scratch, the iconic character. The best part though is when they show all the awful dresses and Spike brings Rarity out on stage, it's so, so good. Pinkie Pie keeps predicting things with her pinky sense and Twilight cannot figure out why. This sets her off since she only focuses on facts and logic. Turns into a wily coyote cartoon for a bit with Twilight getting dunked on and then ends with a big chase scene in the swamp with a hydra. This episode was the basis for an original animation test for MLP from like 2008, so this one's been cooking for a long time. And you know what? You can tell. It's a really full story that feels like a My Little Pony adventure. A lot of locations and some fun sequences. I forgot how long the chase at the end goes on for, it's like a third of the episode. The moral is something about superstitions and how sometimes there are things you just can't explain. Maybe it's supposed to be about religion, but I don't know. I like to think of it more as like an epic glitch in the matrix story on Reddit. You know, if YouTube existed in the MLP universe, I would want one of those videos where the guy reads the stories and he goes, yeah, that's crazy because you know, she did get twitchy tail and something fell. You know, just something to think about. Absolutely no hate though. Everybody go subscribe to Fortune. They deserve it. The Pegasus flying competition in Cloudsdale is coming up and Rainbow Dash joins. 
hoping to perform the Sonic Rain Boom. The Sonic Rain Boom being this crazy move that's only ever been done once by her. She obviously gets anxious about doing it, but manages to muster up the courage too once Rarity flies too close to the sun and falls to her demise. Cloudsdale is such a cool location, the clouds have been one of my favorite things about the set design visually, and I mean that unironically, but having a big place where you see so many clouds and they're all swirly, it's so fun. Remember the old branding for MLP from like the early, early 2010s when they had all these swirly magenta designs on the boxes? That was so cool. I was at 5 Below recently and they had these stickers from like 2014 with these, they're so swag. But uh oh you guys, uh oh. They go to the Rainbow Factory, No. Yeah, obviously more world building in this episode, although I'm not too into the Rainbow Dash Wonderbolt stuff, I acknowledge that this one is pretty cool. Also, Fluttershy is really cute in this episode. I'm not saying that in the weird way, but in like a way that these characters are just cute. They've got, you know, they've got big bug eyes and like swirly poofy hair. It's just cute. It's cute. It's endearing. This is the first episode with the CMCs together, and boy can you tell. Their personalities aren't really all there, and they just kinda act like rambunctious kids. Not especially a fan of how they're written here. This episode introduces the stare, Fluttershy's ability which, like, hypnotizes people or something. It's yet another episode where the characters have to journey into the Everfree Forest, and this bit is probably my favorite part since the Crusaders aren't just there to pester the adults. They get to go on their own little adventure. It's weird how in this era of the show, the Everfree Forest was like this super scary place. I mean like later, yeah, there would be random magical stuff there, but like early on, the ponies wouldn't dare go in there like it was actually cursed. I don't know. This episode is kind of forgettable. Listen, the song in this episode makes up for any perceived faults. If you're not bumping it to We Are The Cutie My Crusaders, I don't trust you. Here's where we actually get to develop the CMC more in their individual personalities. It's refreshing to see characters who are naive like this after most of the season so far being focused on the adults. Here it's clear what they're good at, but when the talent show comes up, they all want to do something that isn't their niche little talent. Everybody's like, erm, is that a good idea? But you know, god forbid children try anything new, you guys, yeah. Anyways, the ending really steals the show. This song is just like, the right amount of awful with everything going wrong in the background. It's perfect. Also, this is where Twy says My Little Ponies, so you know I gotta mention that. The one thing that brings it down for me is like the end of the end. I hate whenever they do like the film festival episode in a TV show where they make a thing and it's really bad, but at the end they're like, oh yeah, you won the best comedy award for your thing. Like I get the point and the characters don't do it to be mean, but like what kind of consolation is that? Whether you like it or not, Doogie Hauser, you're admitting to making fun of your friend's thing that they worked hard on. Also, Fairly Odd Parents had an episode like this. Is there a name for this on TV Tropes? Tropers, get on that. Anyways, they do that here and it's kinda dumb. That song is amazing though, 10 out of 10. Rarity gets kidnapped by these diamond dogs and the main six set out to save her. They think she's miserable, but she actually manages to get out of it herself by annoying them so much that they let her go. Okay, queen. They could have made the moral really obnoxious with her being all like, yeah, damsel in distress, I am not. But she actually manages to fend off the diamond dogs in a creative way. You could argue though that it is kind of offensive to have a woman defeat the bad guys by whining and nagging them until they get annoyed with her, but that's obviously Rarity's plan. She isn't just doing it because she's outsmarting them. You know, yes, female agency. They also overpower them using physical violence, so you know, they're strong in both ways. Overall, it's an adventure with some twists and turns. This episode feels very G1, with all the ponies having to escape from some random monsters and running around in the cave. Dude, replace Rarity with Heartthrob and have these weirdos voiced by Charlie Adler, it would literally be a G1 episode. This episode also gets a plus for being the original appearance of Chad Spike, the classic character. Fluttershy starts modeling for Rarity's fashion line, but becomes more popular in the fashion world than Rarity ever did. Because of that, Rarity is green with it. 
This one was pretty forgettable and for like no reason. It's a fine episode, but doesn't have anything that sticks out too much. I think it just blended in my head together with Suited for Success. The only real thing I remembered from this one as a kid was the part where Pinkie Pie goes FOREVER! But even then, that might have been from a YouTube poop, so I don't know. The whole thing just feels like some inconsequential sitcom story, like a 15 minutes of fame thing, and they don't do anything too interesting with it. What also makes it feel like a sitcom is Twilight gets this weird little B story where she has to keep a secret what the two think. If we're talking about the visuals, I do like all the dress designs, those are always a good time. This one is okay. Finally, the racism episode. The ponies all travel to Appaloosa, this town out west where a bunch of settlers have set up. Their visit is interrupted though when the settlers come into conflict with the native tribe of Buffalo and listen. I did read somewhere that they got approval from some native organization for the portrayal in this episode, so I'm not gonna say anything about it. Not only that, but it's just not my place to. But besides all that, this episode is more famous for the I'd like to be a tree scene and that one little song that Pinkie Pie sings. You know, it's mid-tier, but you know. Fun fact, I cannot watch the opening for this episode without thinking of this one YouTube poop. I would recite it for you, but they talk about doing horrible things to that tree, so I'd rather not risk demonetization. The scene where they're on the train at night is fun, showing the main six just hanging out, and this is our first episode with a desert setting. It's another adventure where the main six get split up and reunite. If you take all the real-life political implications away, it's an interesting story about compromise. Also, Twilight says anybody in this episode, clearly no respect for the established lore, 0 out of 10. Every pony is so scared of Celestia in this episode. Maybe they're just trying to impress her, but it doesn't come off that way when she's like a mother goddess who can control the sun and moon and could vaporize any pony in an instant. I mentioned this in my ancient retrospective, but in these early episodes, you really do feel this family dynamic between the whole cast. Celestia is like a mother or a teacher figure, the main six, like the older kids, Spike is a little brother. Cutie Mark Crusaders being, I don't know, like weird uncles or whatever. The princess drops by with her pet phoenix, and since Fluttershy doesn't know what a phoenix is, she assumes the worst. She steals the bird from the princess, and hijinks ensue. The design of the reformed phoenix is cool, and I like the part where they're chasing it around Ponyville. Not too much to say about this one right now. The world building in the show is so interesting. I am not surprised that so many people make OCs for this. Cutie marks and like pony races in general are kind of like Hogwarts houses or lightsabers or that. Some cool thing that everyone has and you can make their own. Anyways, the CMC go around asking the main six how they got their cutie marks. By the end, we learn that all of them are connected. When Rainbow Dash did her first Sonic Rain Boom, it set off a chain reaction to where all the others got their marks. Obviously, this one gets into all their backstories, which is good for lore reasons, including Rainbow Dash's first Sonic Rain Boom and Twilight hatching Spike from an egg, Pinkie Pie's family coming from a rock farm, etc. All these things are big aspects of the show that we see more of later, mostly in the later seasons when they started running out of ideas. Spike is green with it after Twilight brings home an owl as a new assistant. After reading a book with an evil Illuminati symbol on it, <gasps> Spike tries to get rid of the bird. I do feel bad for Spike here, literally all of his jobs get taken for a bit. Twilight is like, oh it was just a misunderstanding. But what was there to misunderstand? This guy was useless for like a week when Aloysius O'Hare showed up. It's so sad when he thinks they don't love him anymore and he runs away, poor guy. What I completely forgot about this episode was like the ending where they have the recolor dragon from Dragon Shy. These early episodes really like their random big creature encounters. Overall, it's a good episode. Pretty nice Spike story, and it has all those fun little season 1 touches. This one opens with a banger Pinkie Pie song. Singing Telegram is like high tier. The plot here is that thing where one character thinks every other character forgot their birthday, but turns out they didn't, etc. But here it's Pinkie Pie who forgets her own birthday and the main six plan a party to surprise her. It's weird. Like the beginning of Griffin the Brush Off, Pinkie Pie is a little unreasonable, but given what goes on later, it's completely justified. The main six are acting really sus here. 
I think it's a little confused, but the main six do have it coming. Plus, it's not too unreasonable for people to think the way Pinkie Pie does here. Something about mental health. I don't know. Also, Pinkamina! <laughs> Here we are, the season 1 finale. The main six are gearing up to go to the Grand Galloping Gala and have all these ideas about what they're gonna do. But uh oh, everything goes horribly wrong. It's too crowded for Rainbow Dash to talk with the Wonderbolts, or for Twilight to get a word in with Celestia, Pinkie Pie is too much of a party animal, Fluttershy is out of luck with the Menagerie, Applejack can't make any sales with a little cart, and Rarity's date is a complete female dog, voiced by Kai from Ninjago. The gala is a recurring plot thread, first Ticketmaster and then suited for success. You really do feel the excitement leading up to it, and they even sing a little song! One of the best of the season. Rainbow Dash's part goes insanely hard. The song also lets us know everyone's expectations for the gala, right before they shatter them. Songs like that are the best in the show, the ones that take the place of otherwise kind of like normal montages or scenes. They even have another song later on showing how miserable everyone is. Again, Canterlot Castle is such a fun location, and with all the main six going off and doing their little thing, we see different parts of it. Even though everything goes wrong, they manage to bond over it at the end, along with the princess, who this whole time just wanted a little bit of excitement. Overall, it's pretty mellow compared to a lot of the season finales, but it fits in with the more intimate feeling that the season has. Best Night Ever is a cozy end to a cozy season. <laughs> Season 1 is great. You can tell they're getting the hang of things, but you can really feel that they're trying. And it pays off. You know, there's a reason people like it. Personally, I like the more cozy slice of life episodes, but the big adventures are nice too. Even those episodes have this kind of inconsequential feel to them. Here it feels like Equestria is this big world full of mysteries and different creatures that we're kind of yet to discover, but we also, like, already know. It's weird. Season 2 starts out with the return of Harmony 2-parter, featuring Discord. Discord is a Draconicus who uses chaos magic to just do whatever. He escapes after like a thousand years in stone and messes up Equestria. Now it's up to the main six to stop him. Discord, as a character, is such a good villain here. He's so goofy but is still an actual threat. He's just what this kind of episode needed. I've said it once and I'll say it again, I really like the version of him in stained glass. It's so jarring once we see the real one and he's just kind of ugly. Not ugly ugly, but this design doesn't scream main character material, you know? I like that he's just one big squiggle though, that's so early G4. These early concept sketches for him are so fun, I wish that when they brought him back they kept him on four hooves or like flying. He looks like such a dope when they have him just walking around. Of course, I need to mention that he's voiced by John Delancey, known as Q from Star Trek, and Jane's dad from Breaking Bad. Fun fact, during that arc in Breaking Bad, the John Delancey character sees that his daughter is with a guy he doesn't approve of, so it's pretty much the same plot as Daughter of Discord, you know, just replace Mothball with Jesse Pinkman. After hearing that the voice actor thought Discord would only be a one-off role, you can kind of tell here, but that's probably a placebo effect on my end. Or I'm comparing in my head the way he's doing it here to the way he does the voice in the rest of the show. Here they're actually trying to have him be menacing, you know, as menacing as a My Little Pony villain can be. This part ends with the main six all being hypnotized by Discord into being the opposites of their elements of harmony, which I like. It's the first big twist they've put on the elements and feels like a test of their friendship. Thanks to Discord, all the ponies are evil, except for Twilight. They had to make it back to Ponyville, which Discord has totally turned upside down. The evil main six act how you all expect them to act. You know, this is a concept they had to do eventually, and it works out really good. I also like the little bit where Spike has to replace Rainbow Dash. They always give Spike the best bits in the show, I don't know what it is. In these past two episodes, I've noticed the animation getting a little more polished. Some would say stiff. I think it's better personally when they're more loose, but you can see this as them getting used to the rigs they're using, and making everything more refined. Twilight has to write a letter to Celestia telling her about a friendship lesson she's learned this week. But, uh-oh! Twilight doesn't have a friendship problem to write about. She's more dry for content than the Chris Chan YouTuber post-2020. 
I wrote that before they got out of jail, okay? So she goes out and tries to find a friendship problem she can solve and write about in time. And if she can't do that, she's gonna make one. I'm gonna be straight to the point, I'm not a fan of this episode. Her being neurotic is understandable, and I get that's what they're going for in the story, but it doesn't feel like Twilight, or at least this version of Twilight. Later seasons would always have her act like this, but usually it would be some crazy magic responsibility, like restoring the Crystal Empire or doing whatever she needed to do in Rainbow Rocks. I'm not going to be one of those people saying the prerequisite for a good My Little Pony episode is that everyone has to be nice to each other all the time, but come on. She's going around assuming that all her friends are arguing with each other, and then at the end tries to get people to fight, because? She turns into a Chad God Complex Manipulator Sigma, and that's not my twilight. Hashtag not my twi. I feel like you could have done this episode a lot differently. In fact, you even could have had the whole ending with people fighting over the doll. Just have Twilight use it as a last, last resort. It ends with Celestia understanding, and now all the main six have to write to her. Oh yeah, Twilight, push your schoolwork on your friends now, okay. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, you guys. You guys, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Halloween episode. Yeah! The Pony Villains are celebrating Nightmare Night, a holiday dedicated to Nightmare Moon, where they just do Halloween stuff, but it's not Halloween, okay? I really like in these pieces of media whenever they have a big town-wide Halloween celebration. I wish they had that IRL when I was a kid. The classic color scheme of Ponyville at night goes really well with all the spooky decor, and the in-character Halloween costumes are always a plus. Everyone's having a gay old time until, uh-oh, Princess Luna comes back. Since everyone assumes she's still Nightmare Moon, they all panic and are afraid of her. Or, they're not afraid of her. You see the moral in this episode is like really weird. I don't know what they were going for, Luna eventually gets on the town's good side, but there's a misunderstanding and then they're scared of her again. But then Pinkie Pie is like, um, actually, we were just acting scared because it's fun. And then all the kids turn around and say that, I have like no idea what's going on. The fun parts in this episode make up for the weird story. The setting, plus some bits like Fluttershy running into the door, give it a lot of charm. I also gotta mention Luna. Her season 1 design is cool, but this is THE Luna. I'm not gonna try and be a contrarian like all these bronies out there and say that her season 1 design is, like, better. This one's cool and looks like Celestia, but I wish they kept them the same size. I know they're not twins, but I don't know, it feels a little wrong. Also for the change, I always just assumed that this was because she got more powerful after being defeated in the first two-parter. I don't know. Her voice and personality, if I'm gonna keep on going about her, it's nothing like the rest of the show. She's really like shy and demure and like wants to be around people. It's weird. And you can definitely tell that she's the same voice actor as Rarity here. They sound a little too similar. Twilight Sparkle has spoken of the sweetness of thy voice. We ask thou teachest us to speak as thou speakest. Overall, Luna Eclipse is okay. We're off to a rocky start this season. Am I right, bronies, or am I right? Here we get our first look at Sweetie Belle and Rarity's relationship. Rarity's folks are going away, so she has to take care of her little sister or daughter, depending on what school of thought you fall into for the week. Her name is Sweetie Belle and she wants to play. Her name is Rarity and she has to work all day. Sweetie Belle wants to work with her and help her a lot, but Rarity to please keep her mouth shut. In the first half of this episode, Sweetie Belle can't catch a break. She keeps messing up, but in that way where you try to make things better, but it's the opposite of what the person wanted, you know? Contrasting their relationship with Apples, Jack, and Bloom was a good idea. Listen, I relate to so much of this episode, going over to someone else's house and seeing how cool their family was, or vice versa. It's like a universal experience. To make Sweetie feel better, AJ competes in the sisterhood social with her. But it turns out, she switched with Rarity. What? This is just a nice episode, you know? It's really, it's about family. Dude, you never notice how much Sweetie Belle and Apple Bloom sound like cats until your cat freaks out and runs around the room whenever they talk. Also, Granny Smith for some reason. My cats are like MLP haters, apparently. This is another episode where every time I watch it, I can only think of a YouTube poop I used to watch of it. Dude, I saw that so many times. We're gonna get our cutie marks in trolling! This is also the Big Lebowski episode. Classic. They should bring these characters back in like a cool, like, like fandom episode, mayhaps. So the plot here is that Apple Bloom steals this flower from Zakora that gives her a cutie mark. 
but it ends up making a bunch show up on her, giving her the cutie pox. The CMC episodes are a lot of fun, and it shows what it's like to be a kid living in this magical world, you know? If the self-insert fantasy of being a pony wasn't enough to sell it, you know, to sell the show, to sell the toys. It's a simple moral here, stealing is wrong, but they throw on some cool magic stuff. The sequence where she's using her copyright neutral loop de hoop is well done. It eventually turns into a body horror thing once the multiple marks start showing up, and the scene is crazy when AJ walks in and notices the... Fapping? Okay, I'll stop. Okay, I'll stop. My sister's speaking pingas! Cutie Pox Apple Bloom would be such a cool custom. Yes, but what's the cure? What's the cure? Erm, Applejack, it's an English rock band formed in 1970. Okay. Okay, again, not much to say. I think this episode is all around a good time. Hey guys, so this segment turned from a review into me, um, putting a hit out to the people who made Animal Jam. Um, apparently the, um, the Animal Jam music is so valuable to them that they feel the need to copyright strike it when I put it in the video, and I, I really don't have enough time to re-edit this, um, or find the original audio and redo that, so, um, yeah, can you guys go and yell at the people who made Animal Jam to to not <laughs> copyright strike this. Um, but yeah, uh, May the Best Pet Win. It was a very predictable episode, but it, it's cute. And the biggest problem, it's, it's really predictable. Two rainbow episodes in a row. I noticed they do that a lot. First two CMC episodes in a row, and now this. I think in season one, they had like two rarities back to back. In this one, Artie goes around helping ponies and eventually gets treated like some sort of superhero. The prey she gets supposedly inflates her ego, making her obnoxious to be around, so the main six perform a gang-stalking psyop to humble their friend. I feel like they could have pushed Rainbow Dash further and made her actually obnoxious. The main six see her celebrating and are like, "Oh, what a female dog. So they go out of their way to form this whole plan just because Rainbow Dash was a little, and I mean a little, too cocky. Dude, Applejack won a whole award for saving people last season, but now because it's Rainbow Dash, it's suddenly bad? Okay, you guys are just like, like haters. The one thing I like about the story is that all the main six get to be this mysterious new hero. The Mare-Do-Well is a cool design, and I like that the music is obviously copying the sounds from the Danny Elfman Spider-Man score. Dude, the main six got Rainbow Dash near the end of this thing like Eddie Brock in the church in Spider-Man 3. Besides that, this episode doesn't have too much to make it stand out. Definitely going a little lower, but not bottom of the season. This episode starts off with them stealing a character from The Simpsons. Can't believe Fox didn't sue Hasbro for this obvious copy of Squeaky Voice Teen, the classic Simpsons character. Speaking of Simpsons, this episode kind of reminds me of that one where Marge gets the Chanel suit and pretends to be all upper class. Rarity stays in Canterlot for a bit, and catches the attention of some well-known pony aristocrats. She decides to live it up, while neglecting her birthday present she was gonna make for Twilight. Canterlot is a nice setting, aside from the street that shows up in that one promo image they keep using, absolute jump scare whenever I see that. And the pony designs they introduce are... okay. Fleur de Lis is a highlight, and this random grey one's voice is so obnoxious that I can't help but love her. A delight, Rarity! An absolute delight! Rarity's outfits, of course, are a highlight as well. This one with the beret and the little sweater, iconic. Classic. I believe the kids call it Slay. We also get the best song in the show, according to an ancient video I made. And guess who shows up in his last appearance? Prince Blueblood, before he gets written out of the show. Hashtag goodnight, sweet prince. It ends with them doing the sitcom two places at once thing with the main six going over for Twy's birthday, and Rarity going back and forth from that to a fancy unicorn party. It ends with the main six not knowing that Rarity lied about being from Ponyville and knowing them, and all that, which, yeah, could be seen as a flaw, but come on. This is what Rarity wanted since she was a filly. Let her slip past angry brony reviewers, please. Please let it slide. But yeah, thank goodness Rarity isn't the element of loyalty, am I right? I also need to mention the thing with the hors d'oeuvres. Um, something about napkins and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. You know, she's like, she's like the napkin thing. You guys, you guys napkins from JoJo. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's Spike's birthday and everyone gets him a present. Since he's never really gotten the big birthday, he goes crazy with greed and starts taking stuff from people. 
Eventually, we learn that all dragons are like inherently greedy, and the more Spike takes, the bigger he gets. I think it's supposed to be about puberty? Anyway, this one is a great little adventure. It shows that Spike is still a kid, he's naive and stuff. Reminds me of feeling Pinky Keen or Dragon Shy. Yes, because there's a big creature, but also it's a really tight little story. At the end, he turns into a big kaiju and does the King Kong thing with Rarity. You know, it really shows that Spike can do like no wrong, since the only episode where he's the bad guy so far is the one where he's under magical influence. Hashtag Spike Best Character 2023. The lore episode people. The ponies are tasked with putting on the Christmas, hearts warming, pageant, and canterlot, and we get to hear the story about how all the different kinds of ponies came together. It's an origin myth for the pony world, which turns out to be 100% real as revealed in the end. The fire of friendship and all that comes with it that's like essential pony lore. The monsters that turn everything into snow in the story called wind egos, which sounds like an already existing mythological creature but isn't based off them at all. I'm guessing whoever wrote this just looked up creature names that they could make a cool pun out of, and that one stuck out. The visuals here are cool. Any nice little forest setting is a plus in my book. The outfits they wear are all based on different time periods, and I couldn't keep my mind off it. How like Rarity is supposed to be a 17th century French king or something, and Pinkie Pie and AJ are weird Englishmen, and the Pegasi are Romans, but it's also medieval times, whatever. Not much to say about this episode, it would kind of be like reviewing the manual for a video game, you know? You know, it, it's really about family. Apple Bloom is embarrassed by Granny Smith's eccentric ways, and since it's family day at school, that means Granny has to give a presentation in front of the whole class. Apple Bloom tries everything in her power to stop it, but Granny still shows up and gives us more lore. That's right, you thought we're done? No. No, more lore. More lore. Apparently, Granny Smith's family is like the founding family of Ponyville, with her being responsible for them being able to maintain Sweet Apple Acres. Dude, that's crazy. On top of that, you also have the Zap Apple Jam Harvest going on, which is this crazy magical thing that only happens once a year. There's actually a lot going on here, which I really appreciated. It all has a purpose to it, with the Zap Apple Jam preparation being what gets Granny acting all funky, also helping the Apples found Ponyville in the flashback. It's sweet. you guys, Mr. and Mrs. Cake are both Earth Ponies, but their babies are a unicorn and a pegasus. What kind of crazy observations could you make with that, huh? Ugh. Personally, I'm not a fan of this episode, but that's definitely just a me thing. I bet the message of this episode is applicable to kids who do babysitting gigs or have, like, baby siblings or cousins, but you know, not me. <sighs> me, whatever the children's show I'm watching is for children. The only thing I really like about this episode is at the end when the twins are like, Pinky! Bye! It's so stupid, it makes me laugh every time. <music> Applejack is sent off to the big Equestria Rodeo, but upon not winning anything, she decides to leave Ponyville forever. She ends up working for Los Pollos Hermanos in order to give money back to the town, which she said she would get after she won a bunch of medals, which she didn't win any medals, so, you know. In the context of it being early in the show's run, it's reasonable that the shame makes AJ leave, because here they weren't superheroes like they are in later seasons or whatever, they're just some friends, so you know. But forget all that, you guys, this is the derpy episode. Unfortunately, Netflix only has the censored version. Now be careful, Rain Cloud. Listen, if anything, this episode is more ableist towards Pinkie Pie this whole time. They treat her like she's off her rocker. It's cider season, and the Applejack family is raking in the cash. These charlatans, there's no other word for them, come in saying they can make cider quicker and cheaper than they can. So the two parties hold a contest. The apples win in the end with the help of the main six and with the help of quality control, which these two do not have. The song in here is such a bop. I'm going to do that YouTuber thing where they're like, erm, the songs move the story along. And, you know, do they do. They do that and it's great. All the songs in the show are really solid and, you know, they do that. 
Besides, like, the obvious drawn-out comparison you can make, it's a nice message about people versus automatic corporations. You know, people who make because they care about the quality versus people who produce whatever slop they can because the masses eat it up. G4 versus G5. Rainbow Dash gets in the hospital and has to read a book to pass the time. But she doesn't want people to know she's reading a book, so she has to hide it, and eventually once she's better, she has to sneak back into the hospital to get the book again. The fantasy sequences when she reads are cool. The book is called Daring Do, about this Indiana Jones pegasus. Apparently, she's voiced by some actress who was in My Little Pony Tales, so that's cool. If I don't have too much to say about these early episodes, that usually means they're generally pretty solid. And it's about Rainbow Dash, and I don't have much to say about Rainbow Dash. There's a message about liking things outside your usual range of interests, and I think it was supposed to be something about being a brony? I don't know. After finding out that their teacher, Miss Cheerily, doesn't have a partner, the CMC try to pair her up with Big Mac. This eventually leads to them giving the two a love potion, and as you guessed, hijinks ensue. This is such a fun series of events. They're so stupid they do this thing and get in over their heads and mess everything up. For the Valentine's episode of a My Little Pony show, this one's pretty chaotic. Big fan of this one. Also, button mash, you guys. You guys, it's the gamer. The gamer one. This episode starts with a smile song, which I don't even need to talk about. You already know. It's catchy and all, but the performance she gives too is really, really fun. The rest of the episode, um, um, this donkey named Cranky Doodle comes to town, and Pinkie Pie just messes things up for him for a while, and does something good for him, and he kinda likes her a little, but you know, Cranky's a little more interested in his new wife. Okay, thanks, Pinkie. Okay, but for real, I wish these shows would teach kids the lesson that sometimes people just don't want to be bothered. Pinkie Pie's a little obnoxious in the first half, trying to get him to smile no matter what. And even when he says thank you for all the stuff she does, she's like not satisfied. Dude, Pinkie Pie, go to therapy. The paper cut style thing they do near the beginning is fun. And it's not a horrible episode. I just have a little, little bit of a complaint with it. This guy, Cranky Doodle, clearly isn't being tortured at the hands of Pinkie Pie, like one of those Spongebob episodes people like to complain about. It's cute, but maybe not my thing. Dude, yes, talking about bad Spongebob episodes, Mr. Renner hated this one. Insert turning red joke here. Stop dogpiling on Mr. Renner, you guys. Everybody seems to be bossing Fluttershy around this week, so she goes to a Jordan Peterson seminar where they teach her how to be tough. She takes her newfound assertiveness too far and ends up hurting people. This is just really funny to me because I like to picture Fluttershy going through her Joker arc. Like, this is what happens when a nice guy loses his temper but it's really not like that. The idea is supposed to be she doesn't mean half the things she's saying, and or is going power mad by realizing that yes, you can get across a message with violence. Also, I'd like to thank the Dr. Wolf Fluttershy episode for putting my view of this episode in a different context. I just like it because it's funny, but it's not the best out of the season for sure. Oh my god, dude. Future Twilight comes to the present to warn present Twilight about something horrible that's about to happen. Since Twilight doesn't know what the bad thing is, she future-proofs everything for the next week. When nothing actually happens, she still worries about what's gonna happen, and this eventually leads her to travel back in time, and we realize that Future Twilight actually told past Twilight not to worry about any disasters. Twilight being neurotic here is better than in Lesson Zero because she has actual things to worry about or at least an actual mystery to worry about. Overall, it's a nice adventure with Pinkie Pie and Spike being great comic relief. Also, somebody just needs to make an edit of this episode where Future Twilight goes back and it loops forever. That would be really, really funny. Okay, I could not structure this segment based off my notes. Half of this stuff I wouldn't feel comfortable saying on YouTube. Anyways, Dragon Quest is about peer pressure and toxic masculinity and, and stuff. Spike goes to join a group of dragons after fearing he's become too much like a pony. Turns out all the dragons are awful, so it ends up with him going back to the ponies and not worrying about being a dragon. I feel like it could have been a lot better if they had like one good dragon and made it something about like, you see Spike, being a dragon isn't about being mean. But I, I don't know.
in Equestria, the Pegasus ponies have a special job to do. Every year, to keep water flowing throughout Equestria, in order to bring up the water to the weather factory in Cloudsdale, the Pegasus ponies of the designated town would have to form a tornado. The amount of speed slash energy or wing power required was 800, a significant feat for any group of Pegasi. Just the year before though, the Pegasi in a town called Philadelphia delivered the water using 950 wing power, setting a new wing power record throughout Equestria. It was then a Pegasus named Rainbow Dash would try and push the record even further. She and the Pegasine Ponyville did the math and found out that if all the Pegasus ponies could get their speed up to 10 wing power combined throughout all of Ponyville, they had a shot at a thousand wing power. It was up to everyone to do their part if Ponyville wanted a shot at the record. A Pegasus named Fluttershy fell short of the 10 wing power that was required, however. In the initial practice runs, Fluttershy registered an 0.5, less than 1. After extensive training and optimizing her run, Fluttershy only managed to up her wing power to 2.5, 2.3 once retimed by Spike. It seemed that although Ponyville could carry the water, the record was out of reach. On the day of the run, with Fluttershy on the sidelines for moral support, something awful happened. The feather flu left 8 Pegasi unable to do the run. Not only would they not be able to go for the record, but they weren't sure if they were able to collect the water at all. The new challenge was to make it to 800. Still a feat in itself, it seemed like the run was dead. But after a second attempt, they pushed the wing power up to 200, and then 500. Fluttershy decided to jump back into the fray, and something amazing happened. A 798 in total, meaning she had surpassed her own PB, and when the run was retimed, Fluttershy had upped her own PB by 45.7. While the record is still owned by Philadelphia to this day, the story of Fluttershy's over 45 difference in wing power is still legendary within the community. Yeah, Hurricane Fluttershy is a good episode. I wasn't paying too much attention because I was thinking about how funny it would be if I did a, a summoning salt thing during this, but good episode. The CMC get a job at the school newspaper, but after Diamond Tiara, the editor-in-chief, demands more juicy stories, the CMC start making wild claims about the ponies around town. Of course, you know where it's going, they get carried away, people aren't too happy. These newspaper stories get so mean, for real. The first one is about how, like, the baby twins cried in public. Oh wow, dude. Babies do that. What about it? And need I forget, gum on their bum. The CMC realized that making up fake stories for the sake of drama is bad. Yeah, there's something you can learn, whoever YouTuber. Diamond Tiara blackmails them into continuing, and they eventually apologize for all the articles and the twit longer, and everything is okay. This episode feels very stock. I think there was a Spongebob one that was just like this. Not to say it's bad though, I thought this was one of the better ones for the season. <laughs> It's a whodunit! The cakes are transporting a big old cake to Canterlot for a baking competition, but after a chunk of it gets eaten off on the ride, there's a whodunit to figure out who done it. Me and the kids show I'm watching is made for kids. This one's pretty silly and goofy, but obviously the mystery isn't very complex. I like the train design. It's what I talked about in the beginning of the show, that it has this whimsical look to it, being made out of weird gingerbread. I wonder why the train is featured so prominently. It's like, hmm, I, I wonder. It's one of those things where they switch the style up for each of the culprits, which is always a fun thing. These voice actors and voice directors are so lucky I have a messed up sense of humor because this donkey lady would be so annoying, but her voice is just amazing. Behold, my chocolate mousse, mousse. This feels like an episode from way later in the show, like season 5 or 6. Just putting all the main six in some random scenario like this and having Pinkie Pie just messing around the whole time. It's a bit forgettable. I said this in my retrospective, but this kind of feels like a bit of a turning point for the show, with Lauren Faust leaving midway through the season because of Hasbro's desire to push toys. And with their desire to push toys, we have a Canterlot wedding. A line of ponies and playsets obviously inspired by the royal wedding a year earlier. The general feel that people got from this is that Lauren turned her back and left and Hasbro immediately pulled the trigger and were like, yeah, yeah, more princesses. 
Yeah. But let's just see about the episode in question. Twilight's brother, Shining Armor, is getting married to a new marketable princess character. But it turns out this marketable princess isn't so nice. During the preparations, she acts like a total biatch. Twilight thinks this is weird. Actually, Twilight hates her because of this. And the main six rightfully call her out on being possessive of her brother. Yeah, you know, god forbid a woman be under stress or not 100% nice all the time. She must be a wicked witch. Okay, Twilight. But you know what? It turns out she was completely right to be that way. Because guess what? Princess Cadence was actually replaced by an imposter. Overall, it's okay. It being part of a separate thing means I'm gonna have to judge them together, you know? I like that we don't know what's going on until the end of the episode. They know when to play their hand. Cadence being revealed as evil at the end is really cool too. I forget what she says, she's like, No, you are! And banishes Twilight to the mines, it's wild. I kinda wish they made Shining Armor the one who was replaced by an imposter. That would've been more of a cool twist, but you know, what are you gonna do? You know, this is so cool so far. Sigh. If only it got better. Oh wait! The most acclaimed song in the entire show. They were never able to top this, and thank goodness they didn't even try. This day Arya is so iconic, and not even in like the slang way, but in the actual definition. In that ancient MLP songs video, I called it the Bohemian Rhapsody of MLP music, and it's true. They did have to go this hard on it, in fact. And mind you, this is before we know what Chrysalis looks like. It's so funny and melodramatic when the two cadences show up in the wedding hall, I love it. I kind of feel like they wrote this episode from that and then worked backwards. It's that kind of stupid that I just really love. They do big action battle, which I'm not too, too much of a fan of. It's a cool concept, but mm, I'm kind of glad that we see the main six fighting people again. The changelings get defeated, blasted off by the power of love. Of course, only to return in Daughter of Discord. They have their little ceremony with a song that's actually such a banger. I wish more people liked this one. Maybe it's 2010's nostalgia, but the pop songs from the show were always so good. The Canterlot Wedding two-parter isn't as strong as the season opener, but it's not awful by any means. I like parts of it, but yes, in hindsight, the introduction of Cadence and Shining Armor did feel a little, little suspicious, Hasbro. But with that, we're on to Season 3. got two new marketable characters, so why not a whole new marketable race? After thousands of years, the Crystal Empire has returned, and with the Crystal Empire comes the Crystal Ponies. The main six have to journey out to the Frozen North and unite the Crystal Ponies to save them from the ghost of the evil King Sombra. For all the emphasis that they put on the Crystal Empire here, it's not really too interesting. In the show, for example, there's never really an important Crystal Pony character. They're all just one homogenized group. King Sombra too, he's barely a character. They might as well call him just a big black shadow, or if you're gonna be really generic, the darkness. Cause that's what he is. It's really boring, but they want you to think this is so cool. Everything's so dire and scary and ooh, are we gonna make it? The whole thing really centers on Twilight as she has to figure out a way to protect the Crystal Ponies and prove herself to Celestia. This is by far the biggest responsibility she's been given so far and you can feel the weight of it. Apparently, the Crystal Empire contains powerful magic, and Twilight needs to keep it in check. This first part of it isn't really that interesting, they just go to the Crystal Empire and ask around. As for visuals, I'm sorry to say, the Crystal Empire does not have any swirly architecture. Immediately 0 out of 10. The castle itself looks fine and very marketable, might I add. But the rest of the buildings look really gross. I don't know, it's not as magical or luxurious as they make it out to be. You know, when most of the buildings just look like rocks. I do like this weird black magic that they introduce here with the purple and green bubbles, and I think this is when they've started making the main six's pupils smaller. I get it's to make them more expressive, but it's just not as cute or endearing. You know, there's a reason the toys look like this and not like this. I'm done complaining now. Ballad of the Crystal Ponies is a banger. The other one is okay, the other song. Main six are well on their way to restoring the hearts of the Crystal Ponies, but Twilight needs to go and find an important artifact to seal out King Sombra for good. I really like this part of it. 
with Twilight on her little quest. The whole thing feels like a side mission in an MLP video game, which I wish they actually made. An MLP collectathon platformer, or like a very simple RPG, would have been the thing that solves all the world's problems. The whole thing ends with the ponies rescuing the Crystal Heart, and thus, the Empire. Sombra gets stunked on, and the arc ends with Celestia and Luna proclaiming Twilight is ready for something, and pulling out a mysterious spellbook, Herm. Pinkie Pie wants to have fun with all her friends, but she can't be two places at once. In order to combat this, she makes a bunch of clones of herself, but they all go crazy and tear up the town. I like how halfway through you have the real Pinkie Pie thinking she's just another clone. That's an interesting twist on this kind of story. They try to have some sort of message, but it really is just a story about what if a bunch of Pinkie Pies appeared. The ending with the paint drying is classic, but uh oh, one escaped. Apple Bloom's cousin, Babseed, comes to visit from the big city, but it turns out she's just a big bully. Once Diamond Tiara and other ones show up, they all gang up on them, and for the next week, the CMC have to try and deal with it. There's a thing about them wanting to tell Applejack but not wanting to tattle, classic like kid show bullying stuff. Babseed, the song, not the character, is a big highlight, as well as the sequence they do with it. At the end, they have this thing where, oh no, she was bullied back home. So instead of getting her back, the CMC have to stop the cycle of trauma. Overall, I think this one's pretty good. Message is a little eh, but you can tell it's one of those bullying PSAs. I made the cool cat comparison, but yeah, it's very black and white the way it plays out here. Nothing like real life, which you know, you guys, believe it or not, unlike My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, it's a little more nuanced, you know? It's a little more complicated. powerful Trixie is back with a vengeance. This is a full-on sequel to the episode with their last encounter. They even bring back Snips and Snails to be her little sidekicks. So far, all the Ponyville episodes with the main six, aka two of them so far, have felt a lot bigger in scale. Trixie here enslaves everyone and puts a dome around Ponyville so that nobody can get in or out. It's crazy. I think this one's a lot of fun. I like Trixie the threat here just because she's so mean. Like, not evil, she's just really weird and bossy. Also, her voice, it's exactly what you think when you picture My Little Pony villain. It's so, like, good. It's just good. An oldie but a goodie. <laughs> now, let's see what your little charm can do. This is a neat episode. They bring in Zakora near the end and have this fun sequence where Twilight tricks Trixie into taking off her amulet. I always like it in media when good guys, like, outsmart the bad guys instead of straight up using force against them. It's a lot of fun. Pure underdog story right here. Magic Duel might be my favorite of the entire season so far. It just really has a nice tone. It's a Scootaloo Spotlight episode. The CMC and their respective big sisters, and Rainbow Dash, are going camping. Scootaloo wants to prove she's tough enough to be Rainbow Dash's friend, but she gets scared of everything. Eventually, Princess Luna comes in and says, something, I forget. This one's fun too. The way everything is presented here, I assume this was like a Halloween episode, but no, this came out in December. It really feels like Halloween. With all the orange and black you get in these dream sequences, and them telling scary stories around the campfire. I also gotta appreciate a pretty landscape when I see one. I like that even though it's a story about these two, the rarities and the apples get to have some good moments. Big shakeup here outside our usual setting with a focus on a new character, but this one's going up pretty high on the list. It's a Wonderbolt episode, you guys. How exciting! Rainbow Dash goes to Wonderbolt boot camp where she meets this other Pegasus who's just as fast but doesn't like to play by the rules. She realizes that evil Rainbow Dash isn't good like the good Rainbow Dash, so she leaves the academy. The end. Okay, outside of me not liking the Wonderbolt stuff, I think they should have brought back Lightning Dust a lot earlier. They really needed to have an anti-main six with her, Trixie, and like, whoever else. That would have been such a cool episode. Spike offers to babysit the main six's pets when they go out in exchange for some jewels. They always made the gems in the show look so delicious, I wanted to eat one so bad as a kid. 
What they do with this and a later episode where both stories happen at the same time is a neat concept, but this one is just kind of meh. I was going to talk about this in Season 2, but I guess I should here. Ponyville is such a cool defined location. So many little pockets and areas that we get to see, like the town square, the park. Dude, I want to explore Ponyville, or at least know where everything is geographically. I am like, I, I can't believe we never got a proper G4 video game. Ah, uh, finally, the racist barn episode. When the Apple family reunion comes around, Applejack tries to micromanage everything to the point where nobody has any fun or is able to connect. You know, connecting that thing you're supposed to do at a family reunion. At least from what I, what I remember of the older Brony fandom, there was always this idea of Applejack being the straight man, but you do get to see more parts of her personality here. She's really stubborn and wants to please everyone. I like seeing all main four apples together, and Raise This Barn is such a fun sequence. Beyond just regular choreography, there's some really nice animation here, like this one rando playing the fiddle. I'm a big fan of this one. Yeah, you know, oh, oh god forbid, I like a fun slice of life episode on the farm because it's cozy. It's not like this is a comfort show or anything. After AJ saves Spike from some CGI Timberwolves, he thinks he owes her a life debt and goes around doing things for her until they figure out a way to reverse it and they can go back to normal. Season 3 started out kind of bad, honestly, but it's getting better. The streak of past episodes has been really good. Like Apple Family Reunion, this one's kind of chill. For some reason, it's structured like a sitcom, like, like really structured like a sitcom. This part where they're just chilling at rarities and Rainbow Dash comes in because... Okay, Kramer. The plot is really simple and mostly based around gags. The best bit by far is the one where they cut to him making pies. See what I mean? They give Spike the best bits. Him being silly is always fun. The CGI Timberwolves, you know, don't really blend well into the 2D animation, but you know, they were trying something different. They're not on screen for that long, and they eventually do switch back to normal flash rigs when they make the big, big Timberwolf. Discord is back! Princess Celestia tasks Fluttershy with reforming Discord, so she's gotta figure out a way to turn him good. After so many later seasons of him just being a goofball, you forget how fun Discord is as a bad guy. I really like when he messes with people. I think they should've had like one more scene where Discord and Fluttershy get along to sell the fact that he doesn't want to lose her as a friend, but what can you do? This type of story could've been done a lot worse, am I right people or am I right? Discord has this eventual ego death and joins the good side. Yippee! Friendship is magic. This is them getting John Delancey to act in the season 2 thing. The last two episodes have actually been setting up a lot for season 4. If you notice, this season was half the length. Possibly to get to 65 episodes, but I don't know, I'm not counting right now. All I know is that they are gearing up for a big status quo shift as well as some incoming plot points later on. One of those being the Equestria Games. The main six are sent to the Crystal Empire to give a tour to the Equestria Games inspector, but uh-oh, everything goes wrong. The princess is too busy, so they have to keep the inspector occupied, but it's not even the inspector, just some random tourist who they confuse for the inspector. And I know it's a cartoon, but this lady's gotta be on something. You know, her mannerisms are a little, I don't know, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if one of those hoof nails is a little longer than the others, if you know what I'm saying. This is kind of a below average episode, but the way they mix it in with Just For Sidekicks is interesting. They really could have done more with this and had different things from different points of view, but whatever. On to the season finale! We finally have the finale of season 3. It's also a musical episode, which is a big plus for me. Twilight wakes up and realizes all of her friend's cutie marks have been swapped. She realizes that it's because of a spell Celestia sent her the night before, and now she needs to find a cure to this magical mystery. The songs in here are all bangers, from what my cutie mark is telling me, to a true true friend, to the emo one that Twilight sings, that one is actually so underrated. The songs don't move the story along, dude, they are the story. They just keep going, it's a lot of fun. But that ending, whoa. -oh. After solving the spell, Twilight is rewarded with wings and a crown, becoming the next Alicorn Princess, and making millions of dollars for Hasbro. But for real. 
This already was a show marketed to kids to sell toys, so you can't be too, too mad. You know, it really depends on what they do with this new status quo shift. What do they do? Well, besides that, we'll see with the next season, Season 4. Season 4 is the season that I actively kept up with, or, you know, tried to keep up with as a kid. Shout out to Daily Motion. If you know, you know. They helped me out big time back then. I remember having really fond memories of it, but after multiple rewatches of the show, I'm not sure it's my favorite. It's got some episodes and ideas that I really like, but others are just kind of weird. But you know what? Let's jump right into it with the season premiere. Season 4 kicks off with Princess Twilight Sparkle a two-parter wherein Twilight needs to take charge on her own when the other two princesses go missing. And Cadence is somewhere. Right off the bat, you can either see them learning new techniques or showing off a bigger budget with this white shading. They'd use this a lot this season for some atmospheric shots. This two-parter really echoes the first in the series, with this one having Twilight going to Ponyville and the second with the main six exploring the Everfree Forest and finding some new magic thing. It's also canonically one year since the first episode, with it being the next Summer Sun celebration. There's a lot of reinforcing lore here. Discord comes back, Zakora, Sombra's Black Magic, and we even get a flashback to the Celestia and Luna fight where she gets banished to the moon. With all this lore and world building comes exposition. A lot of it. That's my biggest complaint with this one, along with the weird dialogue. Like, I don't know, it doesn't sound like the main six are talking here a lot of the time. I'm not sure Applejack would say try as we might, or Fluttershy, who has this weird line like, what is this thing that could be troubling you so mayhaps, or something like that. It's just off. They also don't know what to do with Pinkie Pie a lot of the time. That's a trend with this whole season. They really, really like having her be random XD whenever they want, to the point where it gets a little, you can't see it with my hand, but a little annoying. <laughs> I don't blame the writers for this, I mostly blame the fandom. I'm sure a lot of you know that the show had more and more influence from the fandom over time, but that goes beyond just like derpy and stuff. I'm sure the expectation of Pinkie Pie being the lol so random fan favorite character influenced them a lot going forward. You can see her go from silly but well meaning to like, annoying. Dude I said it, I said it. Anyways, let's see how they wrap this up in part 2. The main six find the Tree of Harmony, which spawn the elements of harmony that we all know today. In order to restore the balance of magic, they put in the elements and free the two princesses. Turns out, it was all Discord's fault. I mean, it was a thousand years ago, but you know, what are, what are you gonna do? At the end, we get the Crystal Chest, which is this season's big mystery. The chest is one of my favorite parts of the season. This was in like 2012, 2013, when Gravity Falls was coming out, and cartoons were starting to get more serialized. We'll see later in the season, it works as a balance of continuity in everyday separated episodes because the keys they each get for the chest, spoilers, I know, all come from random episodes throughout the show. It's set up so that people who just want to watch a random episode can do that, and people who want continuity can watch them in order. Bro, like the video game, Erm, that's pretty epic. The main six, except for Pinky, all go to Celestia and Luna's old castle, each with their own motives. Rainbow and Applejack try to see who can survive in the scary old castle the longest, Rarity and Flutters are there to get fabric, and Twy is there to study the mysterious chest. This again echoes season 1, with the two-parter introducing all the characters, and then the next one after, involving all six and showing off the dynamics. The castle is a cool location, full of all these booby traps, and we get some fun little segmented moments. Overall, it's just really atmospheric. But wait a minute, who was flickering the lights? It's revealed that Pinkie Pie was there and causing all the booby traps to go off by playing the organ because she just wanted to. Pinkie Pie, you are so random. I thought I remembered this one being in the middle of the season. Anyways, Rainbow is waiting for the next Daring Do book to come out, but it keeps getting delayed. They try to go out to the author's cabin to see what's up, but it's the real Daring Do. Daring Do is real. Like all the stuff in the Daring Do books are based on true events. Anyways, after that, Rainbow Dash tries to help Daring Do on her next adventure, but keeps fangirling to the point where she isn't able to. They do some Indiana Jones stuff, and Rainbow redeems herself in the eyes of her hero. New setting is aight, I like the weird slime green sky, and the design of this big monster guy is always cool. Even though he was in the preview- whatever. This one is just kind of okay. I have in my notes that quote, RD is really stupid in this episode, I guess. 
Another problem is that they have all the main six here, when you really could have just had maybe Rainbow Dash and Twilight. The rest really have nothing to do here, nor do they have any real motivation to be in the setting. It ends with her putting Rainbow Dash in the book. You could get into the implications of everything in Daring Do being real, and go on a whole rant about it, and I'm pretty sure there are like 8 videos from 2014 where you can watch a rant zone of flip back and forth while yelling about it, but I really don't mind that much. It's one of those it's a kid show moments. The Equestria games are coming up. Ponyville selects some school fillies to carry the flag in the entrance ceremony, and naturally, the CMC want to try it out. I'm, I'm getting like serious season 1 deja vu. This one starts the exact same as Call of the Cutie. Rainbow Dash has this running joke where she needs to not get too excited and look professional, and that results in her dismissing the CMC's act, which because of that makes Scootaloo think she needs to fly to make it better, which she can't. They perform the routine like it was before and win the audition, and everything is A-OK. -okay. It kind of has the same moral as Hurricane Fluttershy, with more of a focus on hashtag be yourself. There's also a pretty obvious payoff at the end with Rainbow and the Inspector Lady they bring back from Season 3. I like her, Miss Harshwini, A plus character. They give her some good expressions. I just like this one because you know they wrote this for the bronies. Spike, after feeling like he can't contribute anything to the main group, gets everybody sucked into a magical comic book. The main six are all the superheroes, and Spike is the sidekick with no powers. This is like an essential season 4 episode for me. Something about it just reminds me so much of this era of the show. Having this balance of things that are made to be appealing purely to bronies, as well as kids, because, you know, who doesn't love superheroes? The comic book world is a really fun setting, nice colors, architecture design, and the supervillain they introduce, the maniac, is so cool. Superheroes are so oversaturated, this would be kind of stale now, surprised they never did a sequel episode. Power Ponies works as its own little world and makes more sense than Daring Do being real. If anything, they should have had the same premise for both episodes, have both the Daring Do book and the Power Ponies be magical books. Of course, not in the same episode, that would be way too much, but maybe even make it a little trilogy. I know later on they have Rarity reading this like detective novel, so you could easily have a trilogy of episodes here. It's kinda weird how the main six can immediately use their powers after not being able to properly before, but whatever. Anything that's supposedly wrong, quote unquote, with this episode is made up for with the setting and designs. Canonically, it's the one year anniversary of Apple Buck season. At least that's my headcanon theory. Everything is going good for the apples, but the orchard becomes infested with fruit bats. Not just normal fruit bats, vampire fruit bats. Applejack wants them gone for good, if you know what I mean, but Fluttershy wants to find a peaceful solution. Again, everybody is here, dude. This only needed to be like Applejack, Fluttershy, Twilight, and maybe Rainbow Dash. She could be like comic relief, I know. She goes on and on about that cider. Anyways, it's always fun to see a spooky setting like the orchard at night. The song in this one is objectively good, but I don't like it solely because of how specific the lyrics are and makes it really embarrassing to listen to. Uh, whatever. Rarity goes to the city for a big fashion contest, and while she's there, she tries to be as generous as she possibly can. This gets her in trouble though when she loans some fabric to another pony in the competition, and the other pony steals her entire line. After this, Rarity takes a turn for the worst and forces all her friends to work on new dresses, to the point where she doesn't get to spend time with them, or even enjoy anything. She has a little like sweatshop up in this hotel room, like oh my goodness. It ends with Rarity winning the fashion contest and making up with her friends, and they even get to see the musical they wanted to. Yippee! The moral is a bit more nuanced here. This one is pretty good, and the song is okay. At the end, the evil pony's little minion gives her a thing of thread, which at the end of this episode has this little rainbow shine. Remember that. That's important, everybody. Every This one was so fun as a kid. It turns out Pinkie Pie is like a distant relative of the Apple family. In order for them to prove this for sure, the Apples go with Pinkie Pie to their great aunt's house to track down the original family tree. Applejack pressures them to show how well put together they are on the trip, but the cracks start to show when they all start arguing. By the end of it, they all think Pinkie Pie hates them and doesn't want to be family, but since they have, you know, functional conflict resolution skills, Pinkie Pie is cool with them. It's a sweet ending. You know, it's really about apples to the core best song of the season. This one is so catchy and everybody gets a chance to shine and it's such a good climax with Pinky's part as the last. I am going to complain about one part of it where they do the thing where they say a thing and then it appears on screen. You know what I mean. We understand that she's saying the word sink. You don't need to throw a sink out of the thing. Listen. Listen. 
I love Aladdin, but I won't deny the negative impact that a friend like me had on animated musical sequences. That was tremendous. Ponyville travels to Rainbow Falls, a marketable new location, to practice for the Equestria Games, in hopes of qualifying. This is a neat little Rainbow Dash story that tests her elements of loyalty, but it also has that problem where they feel the need to have everyone in the cast. I get it, Pinkie Pie and AJ do have some reason to be there, to show how much better Cloudsdale is compared to Ponyville, but for the rest of it, they're just there, you know, because. I like that Rainbow Dash fakes being sick to get out of it, and the thing that Twilight tells her about it being the wrong thing to do instead of choosing which team to play for. Also, Derpy shows up. Classic. Discord is back. He's come down with the blue flu and demands that Fluttershy take care of him. Okay, buddy, whatever that means. Also, Orange from the movie shows up in the beginning. I know that was a big point of contention for bronies at the time. Cadence being here was an interesting choice, and again, it's fun to see Discord as an actual bad guy. Glass of Water is a fun sequence, and it works here because A, he's magic and can summon whatever, and B, he's acting like this purposely to mess with the two. At the end, they have this sequence with this, like, Tremors monster that they have to fight to get the cure for Discord. The new location is cool, and if you notice, the Adobe Flash gradients are, like, completely gone now. Instead, we have a more textured look. This was a good time, but the moral is kind of just the thing from the season 1 finale, and it feels kind of last minute. Now, this episode is actually pretty weird. <laughs> come on, come on. A new party pony comes to town named Cheese Sandwich, voiced by Weird Al. He's pretty much the boy version of Pinky and overshadows her when they're planning Rainbow Dash's birthday party. This episode, like the season 3 finale, is a full on musical, and it's so fun. All the songs here hit. What is actually weird to me is Cheese Sandwich himself. I get it, yeah. I never get what they're doing with him. I get it's supposed to be like a misunderstanding or Pinkie Pie is just jealous, but he also says he lied to her about taking inspiration from her at the end and also accepted the challenge to the goof off. What is this What is this guy's deal? What is, what is he thinking? What's his plan? Anyways, I get why they had kids. There's clearly some tension going on between the two. Hey guys, I'm gonna give you a little challenge. Can you tell me which internet celebrity this guy looks like in the comments? I don't have a specific one in mind. This is just me asking because he looks like that kind of person. Maybe Adam ruins everything, but I don't know. Trenderhoof is too well groomed to look like Adam Conover. This episode is actually a lot of fun. Like, a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> Rarity is such a hater here, all because this guy she likes has a crush on Applejack instead. It ends with her trying to turn the Ponyville celebration into this weird country thing to impress him, and she and AJ copy each other, and they get in this big fight, and Rarity says some um, bordering on classist remarks. I, on the other hand, couldn't care less how I look, long as I get the chores done. I think Rarity getting so heated over this guy is funny to me because he's just a loser. Like, look at this guy. I didn't really give this one much thought as a kid, but upon this rewatch, it's one of my favorites. Another one I really like. Fluttershy is an amazing singer, and Rarity wants her to join her music group. She doesn't want to on account of her stage fright, but when Big Mac is out of commission, she offers to replace him by having Zakora make her voice deeper, like in Bridal Gossip. I think I like this one just because the premise is really creative. It's a nice combination of characters. Rarity and Fluttershy are a great duo in my opinion, and Zakora is always a welcome addition. It was cool that they brought back the Flutter Guy voice like this. We get to see a lot around Ponyville in this episode, and as I've pretty much established in this video, I have an unhealthy obsession with wanting to live there. Of course, I have to talk about the ending. Fun fact, this is the first time I'd ever heard any reference to the Millie Vanilli scandal. You know, like what a weird reference to have for the title. Fluttershy gets caught and the main six try to console her. The infamous Pinkie Pie makes Fluttershy cry sequence. Yeah, that's just the new Pinkie Pie, you guys. Get used to it. She did something similar at the start of the episode too. I don't know you guys, Pinkie Pie is getting pretty low on that character tier list. I hate to be that guy, but compare this to season 1 where she holds back on pranking Fluttershy. The problem is that they just make her so oblivious, like they have no restraint. I get it's so she can be random, but it's never done well, you know? It's not unexpected, because you know, oh the scene is too normal, now we gotta have Pinkie Pie do something silly. It's just something that I personally don't like. Anyways, Philly Vanilli is a nice episode. Twilight starts giving one-on-one -on -one lessons to the CMC, 
but now since they're technically hanging out with a princess, they're the talk of the town. Sweetie Belle urges them to use their newfound popularity to get favors from their friends at school, and the whole thing spirals out of control, with the big liar reveal thing at the end. This one is pretty good. This is actually one of the first episodes that has anything to do with Twilight being a princess, but even then, it's not even really about her. I know the writers back then said they didn't want to change Twilight too much because of the alicorn thing, but so far in the season, it's barely impacted anything. If they're not going to do anything with it besides in the season finales, then why have it at all? I'm completely on the fence about Twilightcorn, but the show as of right now isn't making a good case for her. The Breezies are boring, and they're annoying, and I don't like them. The part where they go to the Breezy world at the end is nice, but this one is just a pain to sit through. Applejack is being way too protective over Apple Bloom lately, so she tries to prove she can be left alone. They go a little overboard with Applejack here. I get that their parents are both, you know, but in the episode they never really give too much of an explanation for why she's like this. Maybe just have one incident at the start that prompts it or some backstory, I don't know. You know, what am I gonna do suggesting rewrites to like 10 year old My Little Pony episodes? The ending is neat, not the stereotyped part, but the part where they go to hell and fight the Chimera, this part goes crazy. See, I'm not crazy. Pinkie Pie is getting worse. Everybody's, like, tolerating her at the start. I understand they're trying to be funny, okay? I know. It just doesn't feel like the same character. And it's not that I don't like Pinkie Pie. I feel like the show doesn't like her, you know? Like, I know this is My Little Pony, but there's no, like, nuance to her anymore. Anyways, Pinkie Pie's sister comes to town, and she's the complete opposite in terms of personality. No pony can relate to her, since the only thing she shows any passion for is rocks. They're, miner they're minerals, Marie. Maud is such a cute character, they make her monotone, but it's really endearing. I see why she was such a fan favorite. The moral is something, dude. I forget. I just think Maud is a neat character. Rarity helps out Sweetie Belle by making costumes for a play, but those end up overshadowing Sweetie herself. Even though Rarity went out of her way to help her, Sweetie Belle is still mad and tries to sabotage a big fashion gig she has. This one is kind of a sequel to Sleepless in Ponyville since Luna comes in, and we get some pretty creative dream sequences. The It's a Wonderful Life thing is fun, and I like the idea of her getting a different perspective on things. Or maybe just being gaslit? Like, what are you trying to do, Luna? I mean, but for real. What a better character to deliver this message, honestly. She has a little line in the beginning about being overshadowed by Celestia, so she's been there. It's a nice parallel. The Flim Flam Brothers are back. This time, they're selling a fake tonic that's supposed to make people feel younger. Granny starts taking it, and it seems to work. Even though AJ knows it's just a placebo, she doesn't say anything until the Flim Flam Brothers make up stuff about her endorsing it. There's also a guy who fakes being injured so they can keep selling the stuff, and AJ eventually turns him around with her big speech at the end. It's an interesting dilemma for her to go through, knowing that lying is helping out her family, but also because she's now the mascot of this fake product. Also feels like more of a focused story than some of the others this season, mainly because it's just about AJ and co, without the entire main six barging in. So many episodes in the season didn't need to have the whole main six in them as much. I don't know what their problem is with that. Standardized tests are bad. Episode over. Okay, but actually, Rainbow Dash has to study for the Wonderbolts history exam, but can't seem to focus no matter what she tries. This is one of those episodes that benefits from all the main six being there, as they all have their own way of what they want Rainbow Dash to study. I mean, like, could you imagine this episode without the Wonderbolts rap? No, you can't. In the end, it turns out that all Rainbow needed was some good old-fashioned Subway Surfers gameplay in the background. Alright, in all seriousness, the message at the end is nice about how everybody studies differently. I think I confused this one with Rainbow Falls in my memory because I remember it being way earlier in the season. Anyways, everybody heads up to the big swap meet at Rainbow Falls. The main six split off into groups of two and each have their own little stories. Rainbow Dash and Fluttershy do that thing where they have to trade the thing for the thing for the thing to get what they want. If you've seen the Phineas and Ferb swap meet episode, you know what I'm talking about. Rarity and AJ pool their assets together and then fight over what to get. And Pinkie Pie annoys Twilight, who's there to oversee the event as a special guest. Now, if I'm talking about episodes that feel like a sitcom, this sure is one. Again, like a lot of these, there's not really a clear moral beyond, hey, friends are good, and really just comes from all the little different stories happening. This episode is mainly good for shipping. Flutterdash and Rarejack people dig in because they've both got some interesting moments here. 
Again, my memory messed with me really hard on this one. For years before I came back to MLP, I remember them doing this one in like season two or three. Having it be in season four is really weird. Maybe that's because it's a Spike episode and we really haven't seen him at all this season. After Rarity's thing gets rejected, Spike gets her a magic book that lets her make anything she wants from her mind. Ideally, she would use it and then put it back, but uh-oh, it's evil. The episode just consists of Rarity getting progressively crazier and corrupting the whole town. Kind of a reverse of Secret of My Excess. Also, you could compare it to Magic Duel from Season 3, with this artifact corrupting one of the characters and the good guy having to trick her into letting go of it. I really like this one. It just feels like a prime FIM episode. Also, the puppeteer guy is like one of the best characters in the show. You know, forget Starlight, forget Trixie, forget Discord. They needed to make him a main character, dude. I want to see this guy in like the season 7 finale with the main six fighting the Pony of Shadows. That would be epic. The Equestria games are finally here. This is what the entire season has pretty much been building up to. Somewhat. I don't know. I compare it to the gala from season 1 where it was this constant looming event. Spike is hailed as a hero in the Crystal Empire for helping retrieve the Crystal Heart. After failing to perform his duties as the leader of ceremonies, or something, he redeems himself by stopping this big ice cloud from crashing down into the stadium. Not much to say about this one, just a pretty basic premise. The worst part, and by worst, I mean best, is when Spike tries to sing the Cloudsdale anthem, and dude, you just get the worst secondhand embarrassment. They, <laughs> they cut to like the Pegasus ponies in the crowd looking offended, it is so, so funny. Twilight's Kingdom was the real conclusion to Season 4's story, with all the little pieces, like literally all the little pieces, from throughout the season coming together. A new villain, Lord Tyrek, has returned to Equestria after being banished for thousands of years. He goes around absorbing Pony's magic with the intent of taking all the magic in Equestria. Discord has a pretty big part in this. After being tasked with stopping Tyrek, he gets roped into his little scheme. This is probably the most, like, epic story they've done in terms of scale. Yeah, others there was the threat of Equestria going under, but here we actually see it. The bad guy pretty much wins. So Twilight, surprise surprise, is feeling useless, since the only thing she does as a princess is be a figurehead. A figurehead for toys, am I right or am I right? She really doesn't have an arc, more so uh, okay, I can do this now. We'll see more about that in part 2. The song she and the other princesses sing is just an absolute banger. Even if visually it's kind of boring, you know, what, they're just sitting out on a balcony, what really could they do with this? Since T-Rex going around sucking up magic, all the princesses transfer their power to Twilight, who has to go from no responsibility as princess to the most responsibility. T-Rex continues his rampage to Ponyville, eventually capturing the main six to lure out Twilight. Actually, a lot happens in this episode. Too much for me to put in the simple summary, it basically turns into a shonen anime. The big laser battle Twilight has with T-Rex is like legendary. Say what you want about it pandering to bronies, but this is so cool, come on. Both unironically and just for the campiness of it, random stuff just keeps exploding. The people doing the effects here must have either had the time of their lives or were miserable. There's just so much going on. The situation becomes even more dire as Twilight ends up giving her magic to T-Rex, but with this, she gets the rainbow key and ooh, the rainbow chest. The payoff here is the main six all getting these magical powers, now available at Toys R Us. And speaking of now available at Toys R Us, this whole season is really nostalgic for me in particular with this whole arc. You know, it reminds me of watching old brony analysis videos about what the actual mystery of this chest could mean. It's really fun until you remember what the actual payoff is. After T-Rex gets got, the thing sinks into the ground, and no, don't pull, no! The ever so marketable castle. Listen, maybe it is just a matter of old thing good, new thing bad for me, but this castle doesn't come close to beating the library. I have nothing against them making things to be toys, but come on. At least have it be like a new princessy library. Alicorn Twilight might have marked the end of an era for a lot of fans, but for me, this really was. Not to say they immediately went downhill after this. In fact, I think I'm going to end up being pleasantly surprised by some of the later episodes, but you can see this was a major, major shift from earlier in the show. But let's see. If one status quo change wasn't enough for them, what about two? Fun fact, we spend more time with the castle than we do with the Golden Oak Library. You know, that's how long this show went on.
Here we are in season five. We're in what I consider to be the back half of the show, with this season airing in like 2015. This was when a lot of people dropped off from the whole brony thing, or at least when I did. All I can say is that it certainly became less mainstream, and you didn't see many news articles or anything about it. I also think the rise of cringe culture really had something to do with it. Anyways, everybody is raving about Twilight's new marketable castle. Included with all the various other play features is a magical map that sends the ponies wherever there's a friendship problem. Their very first quest takes them to a mysterious village in the middle of nowhere where none of the ponies have cutie marks. They preach about how it makes them all utopian and equal, something related to politics, I think. I don't know. The way they talk about it more seems like a cult thing, and that's the way I'm gonna go about it, because I'm not doing politics. We're not doing politics. The cult leader is this pony named Starlight Glimmer, and they frame it like this big surprise that it's a pony who's evil but come on we had like like Trixie and stuff I don't know I guess it's new because they haven't done it in a big two-parter anyways I like them playing with the idea of cutie marks and not having them as this weird decision thing yeah the guy who wrote the short story about the Harrison Bergeron guy I know he stole the plot from this the song they sing is an absolute banger and I like all these big stupid faces they do out of all the stock pony faces, that one has to be my favorite. At the end of it, the main six get captured by the cult and have their cutie marks taken away. Let's see how they get out of this one. So season 5 onwards were taken off Netflix a while back, now I'm watching this on Amazon, and for some reason the episode names are all wrong. This one is called Cutie Markless for some reason, like no, it's the cutie map, even I knew that. Sure hope somebody was fired for that blunder. The main six are locked in a room, and with all their marks taken away, they start to lose their special talents. As a scheme to get out, they pretend Fluttershy is cool with the whole thing, and have her infiltrate Starlight's house to get the marks back. Turns out Starlight was faking having her cutie mark taken away. Every pony finds out, and in true cult fashion, everybody turns on the leader at once, and realizes the cult was a bad thing in under like five minutes. Yeah you guys, how dare this My Little Pony episode not properly portray the dynamics of cult leaders. <laughs> sure hope somebody was fired for that blunder. Anyways, the chase in the snow was the best part of this episode, very game attic, like toy attic, but for video games. If we actually got that MLP game, this would be such a cool boss fight. Starlight escapes, and all the ex-cult members decide to have a party. I think in general this two-parter had an interesting concept that they did enough with, not too little, not too much. Twilight isn't feeling at home in the castle, wow shocker, I wonder why, so the main six volunteered to give it a makeover. Frank, the exterior shots in the beginning look really nice though, I gotta mention. This one kinda completes the trilogy with Sleepless in Ponyville and Who the Sweetie Belle Toils. Or Toils? I don't, I don't know. Again, Amazon messes up these episode titles. Apple Bloom keeps having nightmares about getting cutie marks she doesn't like. Well, doesn't like isn't the right way to phrase it. More like cutie marks that end up ruining her life. It's an interesting angle to take it, more of a what-if scenario than the other two. I didn't like the twist, where the thing stalking her throughout all the dreams just turns out to be her shadow. Little anticlimactic, but this one was good. Also, I got a comment on these backgrounds. There's a lot more texture in them now, and even some brush strokes I've noticed. Still goes for that kids book style, but a little more painterly and puts more emphasis on different things. Okay, it's an episode set in a specific time of year, immediately 10 out of 10. Okay, but no, for real. Rainbow Dash's turtle needs to hibernate for the winter, but Artie doesn't want to leave him. Hilarity ensues. The setting here is really pretty, and I like the little nod to the running of the leaves from Fall Weather Friends. The song is also really good. Ashley Ball hits it out of the park. The song is good not just because it's catchy or sung well, well, you know, that helps, but also because it means something emotionally in the story. You know, when you care about the characters singing the song, you're more likely to care about the song. I like the design of Rainbow Dash and Tank's matching slippers, that was a really cute touch. The who's on first bit wasn't as clever as they probably thought it was though. You know, it was something interesting in the 1930s, there's nothing really innovative you can do with a who's on first bit in the year of our lord 2015. This is one of the last ones I tried to watch as a kid. The CMCs are out in Appaloosa for the big rodeo. While they take in the excitement, a mysterious outlaw named Troubleshoes goes around supposedly messing things up for the rodeo ponies. Turns out to be a big misunderstanding, and this guy is just clumsy. 
This one was kind of boring. It reminded me of Stairmaster a little, with the Crusaders getting carried away with their cutie mark hunting, and eventually going on a little adventure. This episode kind of foreshadows what they'd end up doing with the CMC later on in the show, with them helping ponies understand the meaning of their cutie mark, rather than trying to get them themselves. Fluttershy wants to go to the Grand Galloping Gala with a new friend Treehugger, and Discord gets 100% peanut butter and jealous. He can't go as any pony else's plus one, so he decides to bring his own friend to try and make Fluttershy jealous. That friend being the Smooth. Kind of. I feel like they just needed some kind of weird monster for Discord to bring to the gala, and they were like, oh, let's just make it a blob and call it the Smooth. Spoilers, kinda. But out of all the G1 villains they bring back, T-Rex really is the one they give the most thought. You really feel bad for Discord here, not sorry for him, more like secondhand embarrassment from how much he's trying to cling to Fluttershy. Treehugger is the perfect foil to him here, she literally is just chill about everything all the time, while Discord gets more and more angry. I noticed that there aren't many ponies in the background here, there only seems to be like one little group of them, it makes the gala feel a little bit empty. Maybe put a few more Canterlot incidentals here. The best parts here are with Discord and Fluttershy at the gala, but whenever they try to add any other jokes outside of that, it ends up being really embarrassing. Like the cool pop culture references. Yeah, I know Metal Gear. I know The Shining. Yeah, I know Clean All The Things. This one is good, best part is the character dynamics. Reminds me of a better version of Owl's Well that ends well. You guys, it's our first friendship quest that isn't a two-parter. Pinky and Dash have to go to the Griffin Kingdom to retrieve a lost treasure and restore the Griffin's pride, or something. The design of Griffinstone is really cool, and I like the more D&D fantasy feel this one has. We even see Gilda again, the classic character. Rainbow Dash wants to speed ahead and do things her way, while Pinkie Pie wants to do things the way Twilight told them to. Nothing too much to say about that part of the episode, you know, I just felt I gotta summarize the plots for these. Remember when they gave Gilda, like, a girlfriend? Remember that? Remember Baby Gilda? Immediate 10 out of 10. Very strong visually. Cranky and Matilda have their wedding, but uh-oh. Guess who was in charge of the invitations? <laughs> yeah, this is a brony one. This one follows various background ponies and fan favorite ponies, kind of like a 22 short films about Springfield thing, where we see different perspectives. Pretty much every pony you could want is here. Derpy, Dr. Hooves, Lyra, Bon Bon, Octavia, Vinyl, the Flower Ponies, Button Mash, the Big Lebowski Ponies. Pretty sweet. As far as canon interpretations of Derpy and Hooves go, I really like what they did with them. Derpy having a little bit of a Brooklyn accent or whatever is really cute, and it's way better than whatever other voices they've done for her. Tangent, I'm not going to talk about the special in this video, but the way they do Derpy's voice in The Best Gift Ever, I'm surprised nobody complained about that, dude. That whole scene with her is way more ableist than anything in the last roundup. You can tell exactly what they're going for, and the way Rarity acts too is just really uncomfortable. Anyways, the other fan and ponies are fine, but I wish they'd give Vinyl a voice. I don't know, it feels like a cop-out to have her silent the whole time with her headphones on. The stuff with the main six happening in the background isn't too, too interesting. And of course, I understand why they did it like that. It just feels a little out of character to have them just going at this thing instead of, you know, solving it with friendship. There's a season 9 episode that opens in the same way but does it a lot better. So I groaned at the part where Sweetie Belle's like, Erm, it should be cleared up in about a half an hour or so. Like, dude, come on, that's a Family Guy tier joke. They try and tie everything together in the end with the mayor being like, Oh, there's so many different types of ponies here that are all different, but it just feels like they needed to add something to justify this plot. There's a certain video where someone complains about this episode alienating the child audience, and I totally agree. If I wasn't deep into the fandom around the point this came out, I would have not gotten anything here. But as a celebration of the fandom, it's a pretty cool thing to do. After a busy day of princessing, Twilight goes to sleep, and Spike needs to make all the decisions for her that day. Hijinks ensue, as he has to do Twilight's duties and make sure she gets her sleep. This one is really simple, feels like the premise for a short like the ones they do a lot later. It's a neat little Spike story though. Cadence actually has something to do here, thank goodness, and I like all the background pony designs they make for this one. This Taylor Swift looking pony with the orange hair is really cute, I want to know what her deal is. Ambassadors from Yak Yakistan are coming to Ponyville and are very particular about their stay. The ponies try to have everything authentic to Yak culture when really they should have just done pony stuff for them, like 
That's what I assume you do for dignitary stuff like this, but whatever. The backgrounds are nice, and I like when Pinkie Pie goes on her own little adventure, but this one isn't too special. I'll talk more about the yaks later. This part of Twilight's castle is cute, the little nook they show in the beginning. Twilight goes back to Canterlot to meet up with her old friends, specifically Moondancer, who if you remember, she blew off in the first episode. This one has a lot of cute moments, I really like Twilight's old friend group. Moondancer is a nice character, kind of like Twilight was at the beginning of the show. It's cute, it's just a cute episode with a nice message, probably going near the top for this season. The ponies have all been having the same dream? <laughs> Turns out that this is a result of Princess Luna being haunted by a dream demon called the Tantibus. Turns out Luna has been keeping it in her head all this time, and last night it was able to escape into other people's dreams. So now it's up to the ponies to stop it with dream powers before it escapes into the real world. I love episodes like this. They always have a lot of fun stuff. I'm not too much a fan of this interpretation of Luna they go with from now on, where she's all miserable and angsty, but I know you've gotta have some contrast with Celestia. I wish they gave the Tantibus more of a character, and not had it just be a blob, but hey, what can you do? I think the dream stuff really carries this one, even if some of it does get into that epic reference XD territory. I swear, I remember this one being called Rules of Rarity, like the song in it, but I guess not. Maybe just Amazon messing up the titles again? Rarity opens a new boutique in Canterlot with the help of Sassy Saddles, this businessy unicorn lady. Everything goes fine until Sassy makes Rarity start mass producing this one dress to the point where her designs aren't special anymore. I really like this one, it reminded me of the Flim Flam Cider one with the debate about mass production versus care for the product. Or, you know, whatever message that was. The song is pretty good too, catchy, and feels pretty theatrical, especially when they bring it back. It feels like a sequel to Art of the Dress from uh, season 1. The ending is sweet with her making all the individual dresses for people again. The very, very end though, I don't know what they were trying to do with this big green one. Season 5 has had a really good string of episodes so far. You know, earlier seasons had some big dips in quality, but here they're pretty consistent. The worst ones are just boring. This one opens literally at the same boutique with Sassy Saddles, oh my gosh. Rarity has these detective novels she reads, kinda like Rainbow Dash with Daring Do. And speaking of Rainbow Dash, this one's a Rarity Rainbow Dash team up. Yeah, not a combo we've seen before, I don't think, but they definitely work well together. I like in the first half when it's just the two of them hanging out, it's nice. They go to this Wonderbolts thing and it gets sabotaged, with people blaming Rainbow Dash for it, and then it turns into a whole whodunit, where the two try and figure out what's really going on. It was the old guy. I really like this one. The film noir parody makes sense with Rarity getting so into her detective character, and as I said, the dynamic between the two is really fun. It's surprising how well they get along. The one part I will complain about is when they have Spitfire being gone as the main plot, but then this random incidental Wonderbolt who looks exactly like Spitfire shows up. Like, did they accidentally animate the whole episode in grayscale? It's so obvious. Another Rarity episode, three in a row, but I don't mind. Rarity always seems to get some of the better episodes. I forgot they do a Just for Sidekicks thing here, where Rarity mentions not being able to do the Sister Who Social, you know, in preparation for that episode. I do like this formula of using two random ponies, it really works as a solution to the things that bug me with Season 4. Now we can have more centered adventures, and the ones where they have all the main six can actually mean something. Rarity and AJ go to Manhattan to help out with this theater thing being done by Miss Pamel. Yeah, forget the My Little Pony Tales episode, this one is about the magic of theater. There's this message about contributing, even if it's just a little, and it's nice. Hate to sound like a curmudgeon, but the reference humor really makes me groan every time. They're trying to find a friendship problem in the city, and Rarity sets up a stand like Lucy from Peanuts. And it's like, get it? They even have a little jazz thing just in case you didn't. I don't know, it just takes me out. Plus, all the references are so safe. It's either obvious things that Gen X parents and bronies will get, or like quirky internet memes. Oh, finally, the transphobia episode. Big Mac feels like he hasn't spent any real time with Apple Bloom like they used to, so when the Sister Hooves Social comes around again, he wants to do it with her. But since it's the Sister Hooves Social, he's gonna have to act like a girl. Yeah, okay. So this one came out in like, what, 2015? I feel like this was the last time in history where you could do something like this in a kid's show and have it be played for laughs. 
Like, this might have been the last breath of casual 2000s transphobia, as people like to call it. Or, you know what, not even really transphobia. If you watch it now, I feel like this could offend both sides of either political spectrum. Big Mac is of course slaying or whatever, and the overall message is cute seeing him bond with Apple Bloom. I also like the part where Rainbow Dash straight up goes, I know what you are. It does get uncomfortable at times, but not in a like, oh, this is offensive because of my view on social issues way, but in like a gross way. Like I think whoever wrote this really liked the idea of a big stallion with a deep voice trying to wear a dress and makeup and sound feminine. Like they really thought it was interesting for whatever reason, eyebrow raise. It's a musical episode, 100 out of 10. Also, this is the one where the Crusaders get their marks. I think they could have gone on for a little longer without them, but as long as we get some new opportunities for stories, I don't care too much. It would have been cool for the time skip, but you know, whatever. It's basically just the final CMC versus Diamond Tiara episode where she runs for the school president and then gets beaten out by Pipsqueak, the classic character. We find out that there's this generational trauma thing going on with Diamond Tiara and her mom being a female dog. Eventually, the CMC show her the true meaning of her mark, being a leader instead of a ruler. Again, here's where we get the proper shift of the CMC being more of this cutie mark consultant team. The music here? Pretty cool. I feel like they didn't have enough time to come up with too many unique songs. I know there's probably a motif they're trying to follow, but the whole Vote for Piff song and the one that Diamond Tiara sings have parts that sound way too similar. Like, I feel like it's Daniel Ingram or whoever did the music for this one. Going through whatever, like, sounds he could come up with in a day. The main song is pretty good. Of course, if they did this kind of episode and not have a time skip, they'd have to get all their cutie marks together. And I appreciate that they're somewhat unified and have a color scheme that matches each of them. This one was boring. Pinkie Pie finds out that Cadence and Shining Armor are gonna have a baby, but uh-oh, she can't tell anyone because it's a surprise. Pinkie Pie is too excited over how much money Hasbro will make on Flurry Heart toys, so it's gonna be a little hard to keep that secret. I don't really remember much about this one besides them doing a scavenger hunt, which is like a weird recurring thing in the later seasons. Also in my notes, I have a rant about meta humor being lazy, and yeah, I can't remember anything from this episode that was like that, but there probably was something really embarrassing. This goes to show how forgettable this one is. Also, where is Spike? He got one episode this whole season and is just out. He's like not even in these anymore. It's Heart's Warming Eve again, and the Apple family and the Pie family are spending it together. AJ wants to do things the traditional way, but Pinkie Pie's family does things, erm, a little bit differently. It's like the joke in Mod Pie, but with Christmas. Also on Heart's Warming, they have this equestrian flag raising. Yeah, not concerning at all. Doesn't, you know, it seems a little, a little, you know. I like how it's consistent with some of the other AJ episodes, where she's trying to make sure all the family stuff goes over smooth. Reminds me of Pinky Apple Pie or the Family Reunion one. I need to stop calling all these episodes cute, but this one really is. They all get along in the end. It's, it's nice. This one looks so good. Nightmare Night has a whole different color scheme here, but I think it works a lot better. And the framing here too is great. I like the shot of Granny Smith and Big Mac. And there's so much more Halloweeniness to it. They take Fluttershy around the town and do all the stuff like bobbing for apples. Even get a big corn maze at the end. It's so fun. We even see Fluttershy's house during the fall. Oh my gosh, it's so fun. In terms of the story, it was really nice. It felt well paced. Things keep happening. It was very tight. Few things I didn't like the look of were the sick anime references, and whenever they show an illustration of any pony now, they have this like rage comic hybrid Tumblr Hamilton art style. I know, I I'm complaining, I'm complaining. Of course, that art style will be nostalgic to people in three years, and will be the dominant art style again, you guys. Get ready. 2016, it's coming back. Anyways, the moral in this one is nice. Going up there with Rarity Investigates, I really liked it. Discord is wicked, he's a wicked man. I actually forget how mean he is, I just always assumed he turned good and just became kind of a doofus. I like this interpretation of him, you know, he's literally the embodiment of chaos, so the best episodes are about learning to just live with him. It's good thematically, ooh. This one really makes me mad, but I understand that's the point. Twilight comes back after doing Twilight things the whole weekend and realizes that the main six are getting along a bit too well with Discord. She tries to figure out why and keeps thinking that he casts some sort of evil spell on them. But get this, turns out Discord just told the main six not to invite Twilight out with them. They eventually tell him off, but the way they go about it is so weird and specific. 
You know, it's not a bad thing, though. I like it. Discord isn't even doing anything super chaotic or magic here. He's just being a bad person the way, like, a real-life bad person would. It's, it's kind of funny. Open mind. We're going in with an open mind for context. This one was, like, my least favorite. Twy and Shy go out to this valley and try and get these two families to stop feuding. I like the amount of action in this one, and if said Hooffields and McColts weren't as obnoxious as they are here, I think this one would have been really good. Twilight also acts a little too much like late season Twilight. She's all crazy about doing things by the book and is like, ooh, I love studying and research, like that's her only character trait. I get that's what she's like historically, but it just feels different here. Dare I say, flanderized? Of course, they stopped the feud by figuring out what they were fighting about in the first place. Everything's good, the end. Also, I need to mention that this episode reminded me way too much of Fortnite. Like, the background colors, the pine trees, they're in, thing they're in forts shooting things at each other and fighting. Come on, it's Fortnite. Can we as a fandom collectively just refer to this one as the Fortnite episode? Plus, Hasbro has the rights to make Fortnite toys. Hmm, suspicious. Countess Kalaratura, the pony equivalent of Lady Gaga, comes to Ponyville. In tow is her evil manager, not based on Nightshade from G1, which would have been really cool. He, they have pretty similar designs. His name is like Sven Gulli or something. Anyways, Rara and Applejack used to be good friends, but now they've drifted apart and she's become obsessed with the glitz and glam of Hollywood and all that. Her manager is also holding Rara hostage by forcing the ponies to do all this BS for him so that'll let her perform at the charity concert they're doing. The songs in this one were pretty good, they have a little ditty about Equestria, this fake Lady Gaga song that I really like. And then at the end they have this Adele type song, apparently it was nominated for an Emmy. Um, it's not that good, but catchy. Rara's singing voice is really good. It's one of those situations where you can obviously tell it's a guest star, and it's really distracting. Not as bad as some others, but I thought this was some actual singer watching this for the first time. I mean, she is a singer, she can sing, but you know what I mean. Again, with that equestrian flag, I know I shouldn't say anything since I live in the US and we have the flag at concerts and in schools and everything, but come on. You, you know, it just gives little little interesting vibes, you know? Twilight comes home and sees Starlight Glimmer on her table. She goes back in time and stops the main six from getting their cutie marks, therefore dooming Equestria. We get to see a few what-if scenarios in this, like the Changelings taking over and Nightmare Moon ruling, a war with Sombra, it's cool. I do- I have to say, I think it's kind of lazy how Star Swirl the Bearded is just now their go-to for whenever they have to use some ancient unicorn thing. I get that they're reincorporating something from earlier episodes, which is technically good, I, I guess, but it was originally just some throwaway character. The joke was that it was part of obscure unicorn history, and that Twilight was a nerd for dressing up as this irrelevant historical figure. But now we have to have everything Star Swirl now. I guess they just can't introduce anything new to the lore. Hint, hint, season seven. I kind of summarized the whole two-parter from last episode, and that's because these two are really hard to separate. This is the part where they go into the jungle with Sakura and the Nightmare Moon thing. Like the last finale, I can really picture bronies watching this and being like, yo, this is epic. And you know what? I can't blame them. I really like parts of it, especially the Nightmare Moon stuff. Twilight eventually shows Starlight how awful the future is, and she turns good. Apparently, the whole reason she wanted to get rid of cutie marks was because her friend got a cutie mark when she was a kid and she didn't, and they weren't friends anymore. Oh no. Yeah, it doesn't make her as tragic or anything, but I like to look at it from the angle of her taking it too personally. Like her being too selfish, I mean. Anyways, she's immediately part of the main cast now. Again, not a bad thing right out the gate, but they need to show that that actually means something and they can tell good stories with her. But with that, we are done with Season 5. Overall, this season was really good. A lot of fun episodes with some great art direction too. There is a charm that's lost, but there's arguably more polish in the show now. Going back and looking at some of these Season 1 episodes, like, those look rough compared to this. Like, rough. MLP isn't one of those shows like Spongebob or The Simpsons where there's this immediate drop in quality after a certain season. Yeah, there are some big changes that aren't the best, but the average episode quality has pretty much evened out, even compared to the pre-Alicorn seasons. I'm more partial to the Slice of Life episodes, but some of the more adventurous ones were fun as well. Let's see that ranking!
we find out that Starlight is studying under Twilight, trying to learn about the magic of friendship. Her first lesson takes her to the Crystal Empire to reunite with her old friend Sunburst. She goes off with Spike while the main six help out with the baby, who's an alicorn. Listen, I could dive into the lore on why having an alicorn baby is weird, but I really don't care. What I do care about is them not really showing us Starlight's dynamic with the main six. Yeah, I know she was evil to them, but it's something that they have to do to make us understand her place in the show. Unfortunately, that is her place in the show. Starlight really has no chemistry with any of the main six, besides Twilight, and is just this weird pony who's off to the side in a lot of cases. Compare that to Sunset Shimmer from Equestria Girls, who is able to integrate into the main cast. I understand that they're different characters in technically different parts of the franchise, but it puts her in the intro, has this as the final shot of her redemption episode, and just doesn't have her at least hanging out with the main six organically? Like, do they even like her? We see later that she's literally obligated to hang out with them as a part of her schooling. It's so weird. I feel like it would have been better to make Starlight a bit younger, like not a filly, maybe teenage-ish, to at least make the separation from the main six feel somewhat normal, or maybe have her not be a pony, think about it, another creature so jealous of ponies having cutie marks that she wants to get rid of them? I really am turning into a brony over here, dude, dude, get me a door at the Rift Cafe, I'm moving in. The baby breaks the heart, and of course, only good things come from that. Now it's up to every pony to try and save the Crystal Empire yet again. The Crystal Empire is in some deep doo-doo with the Crystal Heart gone. Rainbow Dash and a few others have to talk down these like anti-masker ponies who are like, yeah, King Sombra isn't real, or something like that. We find out that Sunburst is this shut-in who just reads magic books all day and doesn't really do anything important like Starlight thought, but with his magic knowledge, Sunburst comes in to save the day and he becomes the new godfather for the baby. Finally, he got a job. Yeah, that's not the first time we're gonna be saying that this season. I'll take my two nickels now if you please. Pinkie Pie and Rarity go to Manhattan with Maud. The Pie sisters have a tradition where at the end of the day they're gonna exchange gifts, and Pinkie Pie really wants to get this one rock pouch and does anything to get it. It turns into a gift of the Magi thing, kind of, where she trades her party cannon for the thing, and Maud gets it back by doing the nostril flare of total rejection or something, I don't remember. This one's pretty sweet, but not too memorable. We start seeing some of these off-model faces for Pinkie Pie here. So far, they're not too jarring, but are pretty distracting. That's not saying the show has never gone off-model ever, but these expressions are clearly drawn differently from anything previous. You know, at least it's only used for a big reaction here. As opposed to later. The CMC have their marks now and are relishing in their newfound success, but with that, it means there's no reason for them to have a club. Apple Bloom has this existential crisis about not being friends with Sweetie and Scootaloo anymore and sings a pretty nice song about it. Eventually, she helps this guy get a cutie mark and realize that, hey, we can help Phillies get their marks too. I like this one, but I don't know, it seemed kind of obvious. Like, the cutie mark consultant thing obviously wouldn't be all they do. This one feels like an overly long cutscene explaining a new gameplay mechanic. I do like the song, though. Apple Bloom has that, like, chipmunk soul in her voice. You know, if that makes any sense to any of you. It's a dragon episode, every pony. Yay! Spike gets summoned by the Dragon Lord to compete for the staff and to become the next one. I like the idea of Spike having to win the thing to make sure the bad guys from Dragon Quest don't win and use the dragon army to take over Equestria. It's like a nice little fantasy concept. There's also a girl boss dragon who's here too. She's fine, but I wish they didn't show her from the front too much. In this one, her mouth looks a little off from that angle. Reminds me of something they do in G1, honestly, with the ponies being in over their heads against some big fantasy monster. And of course, you gotta have one of them besides Spike who's a good guy. Also, the miner hat with the bow that Rarity wears is just classic, classic. This is the one where they took out the Twilight from it and then they put Dio from JoJo in it. Um. Remember that? Anyway, Starlight is starlighting all over the place, using magic for literally like anything for no reason, until she meets Trixie. The two become friends, Twilight doesn't approve, but she can't stop Starlight. She's making friends! This is also one of the first instances of Starlight never shutting up about how she used to be evil. Like, I get it, that's part of her redemption, and here it makes sense, but later it gets really annoying. Again, compared to Sunset Shimmer, like, she complained about it all the time, but at least those were movies, you know? Like, it served a greater purpose in the story. 
and wasn't repeated all the all the all the time. Trixie makes it look like she was manipulating Starlight, but it turns out she does care. And Starlight saves her from a manticore at the end. This is kind of like on your marks. Just want to introduce another status quo change that isn't too interesting of an episode itself. Yay, Wonderbolt episode! Yeah. The only thing I remember from this one was when Rainbow Dash starts acting like all of her friends. I thought that was the premise of the whole thing until it turns out it's just about her not fitting in. I like that concept, but again, the Wonderbolt stuff just isn't too interesting to me. They start calling her Rainbow Crash, which was what the bullies called her in that other episode. Turns out that they were just doing a bit of trolling and that everybody else has their own embarrassing nickname, even though they never mentioned it earlier in the episode, but whatever. The moral is that hazing is okay, if only just a little bit. Christmas episode and a musical. Oh yeah, whoa. Starlight is all like, aw, oh, they don't like me, I used to be evil. So she skips out on Hearts Warming Eve with Twilight and the gang. Twi thinks this is like a crime, so she tries to read her a story to convince her. That story being The Christmas Carol with ponies. I feel like they've been checking off so many stock cartoon episode plots here. Last season had like the film noir detective parody. Now we're doing Christmas Carol, but recast the characters. So Starlight is obviously Ebenezer Scrooge being the pony who wants to get rid of Hearts Warming all together. In order to stop that, the three spirits show up played by AJ, Pinky, and Luna. Rainbow Dash is the Bob Cratchit and the nephew combined because, you know, they've only got 20 minutes for this, people. The songs in this go hard. The intro, the Applejack and Pinkie Pie song, Luna and Starlights aren't the best, but the others definitely make up for those. I don't think they can really pull off a menacing sounding song. They really haven't been able to since like season two. The evil Professor Snape teacher that shows up in Starlight's flashback has way too cool of a design too to just appear in this one episode and the Dickensian Christmas town looks pretty good. I just wish Pinky's song had some better visuals. Like, out of all the ones you're not gonna have abstract stuff happen during, you're gonna do the one where Pinkie Pie is literally a magic ghost. It would've been so cool to have, like, I don't know, friend like me stuff. You know what I'm talking about. Rarity coming through with the best episodes yet again. This one is structured like interviews with the press where all the main six go through the opening of a new boutique. It just kind of focuses on the problems that each of them have to solve during the thing. It's pretty chill. I like it. There's some off-model stuff, but it works out really nice here because it's drawn in a similar way to the rest of the show, or at least similar enough where it doesn't look like they just traced over the rough storyboards. I hate hated this one when I saw it first. It has such a weird structure. Again, it feels sitcom -y, but in a bad way. We have the A plot with AJ, and then Twilight's wacky B plot, where she has to do chores on the farm. Also, the message at the end takes way too long to get through. It just feels paced a little weird. Applejack is too busy to have a spa day with Rarity, so Twilight decides to take care of her work on the farm. In the meantime, AJ and Rarity have their spa day, and AJ cannot stop doing work. There's this whole thing about her fixing the pipe system and all that. I don't know. It just really doesn't feel like a My Little Pony episode. It's chill like the previous one, but the energy is just off. Feels like an episode of the new Netflix one. Just kind of a nothing burger. We finally see Fluttershy's parents, as well as her evil brother. Okay, he's not evil, but he is that one, like, loser family member who just takes over his parents' house. Fluttershy dealing with him is such a funny problem for a show like this. Like, usually these kids shows have things that kids and or parents can relate to, but this one is, like, such a young adult problem, something people in their mid-twenties have to deal with. Zephyr Breeze moves in with Fluttershy, who tries to get him a real job, but of course, he slacks off and ruins them all. Kinda reminds me of that recent South Park episode with the ice cream store. Zephyr Breeze isn't too interesting of a character, but he serves his purpose in the story. He's a very specific brand of dumb person. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the writer for this was just venting about somebody they didn't like. Also, there's a song in this one. It was a jump scare. Another cutie map episode! Pinky and Rarity get sent to the restaurant district of Canterlot and run into these ponies who own this Indian style place. They both have ideas on how to improve it and get the people to come, with Rarity wanting to conform to the high society Canterlot stuff and Pinky wanting them to be unique. Predictable, but it's fun enough. You're just waiting for that moment where the restaurant critic comes in and tries it and is like, I don't like it, I love it! And then the place doesn't get shut down. Moral of the story, Indian food is pretty good. You know, I, I can't attest to the authenticity of the stuff we have here in the states but you know i love a good trader joe's chicken tikka masala put that in the microwave oh yeah it was awful editor you don't have to put that in <laughs> Patton oswalt is an annoying nerd 
and he plays one in the episode. Waka waka. No, I'm sorry, Patton. You seem like a nice man. Rainbow Dash goes to a Daring Do convention and meets up with Quibble Pants, this Daring Do fanatic who argues with Dash about the later Daring Do books not being realistic compared to the other ones. Ugh. There's obviously some meta commentary here. I was gonna say about bronies, but I realized this was probably written during when The Force Awakens came out, so there could be some Star Wars stuff going on. I don't know. The moral about being able to like different things about a piece of media was cool, and I think Quibble Pants is a really funny character when put into the situation of a real Daring Do adventure. The real Daring Do and all these guys come to the convention center and kidnap the two, and they have to fight them, and the whole time he's like, um, well, that just happened. It's not funny for the reasons they wanted it to be funny, but I really like it. That being said, the concept of the episode itself is really weird. Like, if you look at it as a meta commentary on fandom culture, it's someone who thinks they know better about a thing, faced with a person who knows that said thing is real and all the events of the story have happened in real life. Not the first time I'm gonna be saying that about an episode. Also yeah, there's an entire fandom for the Daring Do books with conventions and fans supposedly all around the world, but none of them except Dash are privy to the fact that everything in the books is real. Yeah buddy, okay. All the CMCs want to make a cart for the Pinewood, I mean Applewood Derby and need to get help from their big sister. But oh no, they take over the project and don't let the Phillies make their own carts. And then there's a big action scene during the thing, stuff gets destroyed, and then they realize they got carried away. And then they try it again, it's all good. Fine, but I feel like I've seen it before, and we will see this exact same plot again. Reminds me of the talent show one mixed with the castle makeover one. It's very standard. Same with the song, not saying it's unwatchable or unlistenable, but we're in that era of the show where the songwriting team is just spamming the man in everywhere and it's starting to get really annoying. If you were starting the show on like season 5 or 6, this one would be great, but unfortunately, I've seen enough episodes like this one. Rainbow Dash is back pranking again like in season 1. She goes too far and eventually the whole town decides to get back at her by pretending to be zombified by the fake cookies she gives out. Even the babies are in on it dude, wow. There was a My Little Ponytails episode with this exact same plot, but instead of zombies they were aliens. Just thought I should mention that. I really didn't take any serious notes for this episode, I was just thinking about how this is probably on the Nightmare Fuel page on TV Tropes, and yep, it is. Oh yeah buddy, still think this show is for kids? Turns out this changeling is a good guy, and he has to try and hide him from the Crystal Empire guards. Thorax gets caught though, and Spike saves the day by I am not gonna lie, they really go all out with all the Discord stuff. Like, it's rigs. I bet they have to model a whole bunch of new stuff, and I wonder who even, like, approves it. I know it's storyboarded and written, but how do they make new pieces? You know, call me George, I'm just curious. They had an opportunity to do another Just for Sidekicks thing, with the main six heading off to Yak Yakistan in the beginning, but I guess they just didn't bother. But that doesn't matter, because this is the episode where we get introduced to the Guys Night Squad. Or guy squad. Discord is lonely for whatever reason, but Big Mac and Spike let him hang out with them and play O and O, which is like the MLP equivalent of D&D. &D. I like when Discord makes the game real and we have this whole world made out of D&D &D stuff. It's really cool. And I like the idea of Discord as a dungeon master. Could have been stretched out more. It's really fun. I like mid-season Discord because he's just a bitter loser. He plays off really well with these other characters who have a basic understanding of friendship. It's really funny at parts. Dude, Pinkie Pie Afro Puffs goes so hard. Anyways, the ponies invent this new game called Buckball. AJ and Dash are set up to compete against the team from Appaloosa, but it turns out that Pinkie Pie and Fluttershy are way better. It turns into them needing to build up their confidence and eventually beat the other team. I like the mind over matter concept they bring up here, and we get to see Snips and Snails again. The rest of these appearances from them pretty much gotta get relegated to these Buckball episodes. Also, can I just say, the Ponyville team colors should have been like a pink or a light blue. The purple and teal look is just too foreign, even a Red would have been cool. This episode features Gabby Griffin, the classic character. Not sure what the fandom consensus is on her, but she's just awful. She's like super quirky, XD, and they did that thing the Fairly Odd Parents did when they added that other like homunculus girl character where her only flaw is that she tries too hard to be nice and everybody immediately accepts her. She becomes a cutie mark crusader by the end, and Twilight and the CMC think she's so cool by the end, and I don't know. She just feels like someone's self-insert fan character. It's cool to see a non-pony creature 
trying to get a cutie mark, but it should have been anyone other than her. My theory about this one is that it was originally going to be Gilda, but they realized that they couldn't make that make sense, so they were like, hey, what if we made Gilda, but the exact opposite? I feel like they wanted her to be a fan favorite, but no. Not a bad idea, but I don't recommend this one. I am Gabby Griffin's biggest hater. AJ and Fluttershy travel to Lost Pegasus to solve a friendship problem. Turns out that the Flim Flam brothers of all people are the ones who need help. AJ thinks it has to be something else, so they go around trying to help other people in the casino. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't say casino in a kid show. It's a resort. Turns out that this Elvis guy was making everybody argue in order to keep them working for him. The mystery is pretty obvious, and they do that one thing where they broadcast him revealing his evil plan to the entire place. Not much to say about this one. Starlight has to do a friendship lesson, but wants to get it out of the way as quick as possible. To speed everything up, she hypnotizes the main six. Again, the only reason we see her with them is the obligation from Twilight, and even then they're hypnotized for the whole time, so you don't really get their personalities at all. They do Amelia Bedelia shtick for a bit, and then an action scene happens where things get destroyed, and character realizes they got carried away. I can see why I forgot this one, there's nothing really interesting about her at this point in the show. Her main character trait, Starlight I mean, is remorse. Like I get she wants to do magic to speed things up, but what else can you tell me about her? There's already one character who knows about magic, and they don't do enough to differentiate her from Twilight. Starlight really works best when she's with Trixie, because there she's a really great straight man, but here, not so much. This one was my least favorite for a while. Pinkie Pie, AJ, and Rarity go on a boat trip and seemingly want to break up as friends. I mean, they kind of can't do that since they're like magical heroes now. Over the past like season or two, we've been getting hints that the general pony public is aware of the main six's exploits, making it really weird whenever they don't want to see each other anymore. Like, I think that would be kind of dangerous to like your whole country, right? I don't know. They each relay their stories of the trip and how awful the other two ponies were during it. I like this more upon second rewatch because obviously their feelings here are just because they're mad the trip went wrong, but if you look at it like this is how they think of each other all the time, you're not gonna like this one. When Apple Bloom tells a little fib, Applejack regales her with a story about a time that she lied as a kid. They were just like, yeah, we're gonna do something different for a whole episode, how about that? And it turns out really good. It's fun seeing a shakeup on the usual Apple family dynamic, with Big Mac being a loudmouth and Granny Smith being more of an authority figure. It's that stock story about characters lying and then the lie gets bigger and bigger. It's fun and I honestly would not mind seeing more episodes like this for other characters. Imagine one with young Twilight and Shining Armor, they've got a lot of potential here. Rainbow Dash and Twilight head on over to the Wonderbolt Academy, where they figure out this one pony has secretly been helping her friend without the friend knowing. I like the foreshadowing at the beginning, where Rainbow Dash says that flying is all about confidence, sets up the conflict for the episode with Twilight wanting to tell the guy, but Rainbow Dash not wanting him to get into a slump. Even if they don't cheat, the two find out that they're a good team, and then they get married and have 18 kids, and the main six get invited to the wedding, blah blah, episode over. Starlight goes back to her old village with Trixie for a little visit, but when she comes back, everything's a little… different. It's almost as if everybody in Ponyville has been replaced by changelings? <gasps> After Starlight finds this out, she, Trixie, Thorax, and Discord head off to the changeling hive to save the others. Starlight is still on the, oh, I used to be evil thing, but here again, it's warranted because this two-parter is about her proving herself, or something. Think about it like the end of Rainbow Rocks. Starlight, Trixie, and Discord play off each other well. I like for once, seeing characters who don't don't want to work together. We finally get to the Changeling Hive, which is a really cool setting. Way cooler than the Crystal Empire or whatever the other two parters had going on. Like the Season 4 one, you feel this really great sense of danger when they're in the Hive. Not like danger danger, obviously no pony is gonna die, but it does its job feeling a little tense. They eventually get to Chrysalis, whose hair is animated frame by frame I've noticed. Starlight is like, hey Changelings, you can be good too, and then all the Changelings turn good except for Chrysalis. They get Medals of Honor, and there we are. Starlight has redeemed herself. 
kind of. I know what they're trying for here, but like the Twilight Corn thing, they don't really put much stock into Starlight as a character. She's just not too interesting. There are some stories you can tell with her, but that's just some. Twilight teaching someone friendship lessons one-on-one -on -one is like a single episode concept, you know? Not sure if they could pull it off for a main recurring cast member. This special wasn't bad, in fact I really liked it. Starlight was really good as the leader of the pack, and I feel like they need to give her more characters to play off of like that. Overall, Season 6 started really good, but kind of had a drop in quality. Not awful, but some of these later ones were just forgettable. Now let's see that rank. Season 7, 3, 2, 1, let's go, let's go. After saving Equestria, Twilight figures that Starlight is pretty much done with her friendship studies and decides to figure out what to do with her next. In the end, she tries to just stay and continue her studies again. I like that they're going for a one-parter instead of the usual big epic two-part premiere. It's nice seeing the season start out more chill, but that also means they're gonna have to set up the big bad or the arc for the season later on. And trust me, we're gonna get to that. Discord is here too, making Twilight nervous just because he can. Always welcome. What I really want to highlight is this is where you can kind of see the show trying to grow with its audience. Whereas Celestia was this parental figure in the earlier seasons that Twilight was sort of afraid of, here they have a more personable dynamic. It's like when you get older and you realize your parents and teachers are actual people you can relate to. At least, that's how I see it. Starlight and Trixie go out for the day, and meanwhile the main six do an escape room. Yeah, very, very interesting. Trixie is the highlight of this episode. She's so annoying and awful to Starlight the whole time. In a funny way, though. You don't hate her for it, because halfway through, Starlight accidentally makes a bunch of people want to beat her up, and it turns into this whole thing. This one's great. I also like the kitchen design for Twilight's castle. It looks really medieval fantasy-ish, and I wish they'd stuck with that theme for the rest of the design. The main six stuff isn't too interesting, but it's really only there to show the difference between their relationship and the one between Trixie and Starlight. The dynamic the two have feels more realistic or mature, if that makes any sense, compared to the others. Again, show growing with its audience. Game theory. The song that the main six have is good, but a little generic. Feels like something they'd use in a promo, like that Katy Perry parody from 2011. I think it is good that they can still make a pop song that sounds kinda current in 2016, though good on them. Also, if they wanted to be more with the times, you had to have the stupid EDM break in the chorus. You know what I'm talking about, you listen to the Chainsmokers. People, I assume. Twilight has to go and help out the six school fillies, but Cadence and Shining Armor show up and have her watch Flurry Heart for the day. Twilight is busy, but she doesn't want to let him down. This one has a lot of just shtick. They go around and the baby does magic and messes things up, and then they actually get to the hospital, and action scene, things get destroyed. Wow, I got carried away, I sure learned my lesson. Here I think it's fine. At least there's interesting stuff going on with Twilight getting distracted, and Spike being the one trying to stay on schedule. It's a neat switch up. Shining Armor and Cadence have this B story where they go to an art gallery, and that was pretty cute too. As someone who's been to art school, the stuff they show in cartoons whenever they have stupid conceptual art is way too accurate to what you actually see. Out of both taking care of baby episodes in the show, I gotta say that this one is the better. The little ending with Spike reading the book is cute also. Maud needs to decide where to move in after going to college, where she's crowned Valoroctorian. <laughs> Pinkie Pie tries to show her around Ponyville, but when nothing seems to work, she tries to get her and Starlight to be friends. I like how Starlight is just getting with all the fan favorite characters now. It's one of those tutorial episodes like what I talked about with On Your Marks. Certainly not one of the best mod appearances, but as far as they go, it's okay. Also, there's like an action sequence at the end. Listen, I get the show has to have a set number of My Little Pony Adventures TM, but sometimes you just gotta let the third act breathe. I remember Fluttershy used to be my favorite a few years back, but rewatching the show now, I don't know, her episodes are just kind of boring. I feel like she was the first character the writers ran out of ideas for. Like, she's already learned to stick up for herself enough times, so like, where do you go with it now? Ooh. Fluttershy decides to build an animal sanctuary in Ponyville, but the people she hires all have different ideas of what to do. 
What's that in the distance about a mile away? Oh, oh yeah, it's the rest of the episode. I can see it. The sanctuary is a mess. Animals wreck stuff. They do it again. Sorry to sound so dismissive. I know what kind of show this is, and I understand that just because the story has a similar progression to another one throughout nine seasons of the same show doesn't immediately mean it's bad, but binging these episodes and seeing these kind of things over and over again just wears you down over a while. I'm sure if I was watching them out of order and this was one of the earlier ones, I'd be saying something different. As much as Brony reviewers will tell you otherwise, this is not the kind of show you're meant to look through and analyze every episode. It gets really tiring. Dude, this is technically our first CMC episode of the season. Rarity wants to spend some more time with Sweetie Belle, so she takes her around town doing things she likes to do as a little filly. But she's all grown up now, Mom. I mean, sister. Yeah, if you want an episode that plays into the Rarity is secretly Sweetie Belle's mom theory, this one sure fits. Another piece of last rewatch trivia. I took like a two week break when I binged this show back in 2020 after this. Coming back to it, I gotta say it was not that bad to make me quit the show. I like that we got to see a lot around Ponyville, including this park location that I don't think we've seen since season two. The side story with the CMC trying to get this kid and her dog to be friends again was nice, and it was a good way to tie into the A-plot. They did a similar thing with Applejack's Day off, but that one felt tacked on compared to here. Another touch I like is that Rarity is wearing this weird flower costume for like the entire last third of the episode. This one's really solid. Season 7 is off to a great start. This episode focuses on Rainbow Dash's parents. This and the Fluttershy one gave me the feeling that they were just doing it out of obligation, like, oh, we don't have canon designs for their folk, might as well make an episode about them. We find out that Rainbow Dash's parents are too encouraging to the point where she gets embarrassed by them during Wonder Bowl practice. In the end, she learns that she should still love her family, no matter how embarrassing they might be. Nice message, but not too interesting. Feels like a Disney Channel plot. Never mentioned this before in the show, but a touch I really love is whenever Pegasi use their wings like little fingies. It's so creative. It makes you feel bad for Earth ponies because, like, like, unicorns have magic, Pegasi have that, and what can they do? You know, just suffer, I guess. Big Mac travels to Starlight's village to deliver some apples, and then runs into his little crushy crush named Sugarbell. The CMC tag along in order to get the two together. Hijinks ensue. The main problem I had while watching this one was how the CMC act here. It doesn't feel right to have an episode where they're acting all naive, right after one where the whole point was how mature they are. And get this, it's Sweetie Belle who spurs the whole thing on. Yeah dude, I thought you were all grown up now. The Justin Bieber pony is fun, if not a little dated by 2017. Whatever. It's nostalgic now, so it's fine. The three other mares based on the three ladies from Beauty and the Beast were also a nice touch. Rarity has AJ judge a fashion contest she's holding, since she wants someone who can see whether the designs are practical. Obviously, AJ doesn't gel with the designs, and is way too harsh on everything. Which, you know, the ponies in the contest aren't really vibing with. This one was nice, it reminded me a lot of season 1. Specifically, like, green isn't your color for some reason, probably just because it's a Rarity fashion show episode involving some other main 6 member. Highlights include Rarity shredding on the guitar, and the cameo from this one My Little Ponytails actress. I'm guessing it was Sweetheart, but that's just how it sounds to me. I'm not gonna look it up right now. Starlight gets sent to the royal castle to help out the princesses who aren't getting along. The two keep fighting over who has the harder job, and Starlight accidentally switches their cutie marks, which gives them some perspective. You could argue that this would have been better with Twilight, but I doubt it. I can't see her switching the cutie marks, or at least doing that and still wanting to be alive after. Plus, they even say in the episode that Twilight would have been biased since she's Celestia's student. Again, like the premiere, it's cool to see Celestia and Luna as actual people. I mean, ponies. Twilight as the music box was also a really cute bit. Note, whenever I refer to something as cute, I don't mean in like the gross way, you know? I mean, it's cute. It's a cute show. One really, really minor like nitpick I have was I wish the Daybreaker design was a little less complicated. Like honestly, the Nightmare Moon design is perfect. All you need to do is like a little palette swap and make it somewhat bigger, but whatever. Beggars can't be choosers. I'm genuinely unsure whether I watched this one or not. Like, I remember some scenes, but this one was just so forgettable. Anyways, Pinkie Pie goes over to the Yak Kingdom for a festival, but when all the Yaks get snowed in, they refuse help. Now it's up to Pinkie Pie to try and convince them. If I didn't watch this one, I don't think I was missing out on anything too spectacular. They help the Yaks at the end without the masking, and everything's chill. 
instead of meeting up at Fluttershy's, Discord decides to host a tea party at his house. Discord thinks his bachelor pad would be too crazy for her, so he makes it all normal and stuff, but with that, he starts to fade away because if he's not around enough chaotic stuff, he'll cease to exist. It's nice seeing this insecure side of Discord again. I think the intro drags for a little bit, but it's not too bad. As far as Discord and Fluttershy episodes go, this one's cool. Also, I just want to ask all the people who actually played with dolls or ponies as a kid, were tea parties like an actual thing that you did when playing with your toys? Or was that just a thing people do in TV shows and movies? Because obviously I wouldn't know. Obvious guest star William Shatner appears as Grandpair, Applejack's maternal grandfather. With his arrival, we get the story on how AJ's parents met. This is another Hatfields and McCoys thing where the Apple family and the Pear family hate each other, but the son and daughter eventually get together. You know, Romeo and Juliet and all that. I think this might be an unpopular opinion or make me seem like a jerk, but this one felt a little bit manipulative. That's a really harsh word, I don't mean it was bad, but this one goes out of its way to be a tearjerker. I hope people understand what I mean by that. I get it's supposed to be sweet, but there are just so many parts of this that are designed to tug at your heartstrings, like the song at the end they sing, and the Sam Elliott pony who's like, your father was a good man. With that, I'm not gonna say they didn't do their job. This one's probably my favorite out of all the let's introduce one of the main six's parents episodes. I will say that Will Shatner sounds out of place. Say what you want about Weird Al or Patton Oswalt, but at least they sounded like they'd exist in this universe. The way he does Grandpair here is too deep and it's just distracting. Oh yay, this one! Twilight & Co. decide to publish the Friendship Journal from Season 4, with it becoming a huge hit. But, with so many ponies reading it, the general public starts to nitpick things about it. Complaining about Fluttershy learning the same lessons over and over again, hating Rarity for no reason, and thinking Pinkie Pie is only there for comic relief, among other things. This one is a pretty obvious meta-commentary on the fandom. Well, it's half that, half them just wanting to tell the story about how people are judging them based on this one thing and not knowing who they are as a person, something about celebrity gossip, maybe? They try to have their cake and eat it too, but it just comes off really confusing. Like, they should've just picked one. Either have a story kind of like Ponyville Chronicle, where the lesson is don't judge people based on one account of them, or if they were gonna do a meta thing, have them be at like a convention panel or something and just center the entire episode on the main six versus the critics. The only real way you can watch this episode without it being confusing is if you don't think, or don't even know, about all the meta stuff they're saying. But in that case, why even have it there? You can't have a meta thing because near the end Twilight's like, what are you guys talking about? We're all real ponies. So like, people shouldn't judge the show because all the characters are real. Maybe it's about the writers, they were trying to do a thing about people harassing show staff, voice actors, because Applejack's whole thing is that people try to be a part of her family. So is it about people getting too attached to the show staff? I guess you have to look at it in the most vague way possible. There's also a part at the end where these two fillies are like, well, we like the friendship journal because it taught us how to be better friends, which I guess is supposed to say that the show is to teach kids when, you know, FIM is not this noble creation made out of a desire to teach kids social skills. Its inherent purpose is to be part of a predatory marketing scheme to get them to beg their parents to buy them colorful hunks of plastic. They even have a bit at the beginning where the CMC are like, well, we can use this book for marketing. And that's supposed to be missing the point of it? I'm getting a little heated here, so let's just dial this back. They could have had a pretty average episode here, but I think the show staff really wanted to vent their frustrations with this one. You know, and if you look at it like that, it totally makes sense. It's just really confused, that's all. Spike invites both Ember and Thorax to hang out on the same day, but uh-oh, he can't hang out with both of them at once. The map brings him around Ponyville as well, trying to solve some non-existent friendship problem, when he realizes that he just needed to have Thorax and Ember get along. I like that for the most part, they got rid of Ember's weird front mouth, but there's not much to say about this one. This isn't the kind of story where Spike benefits from being the main character. I don't think they use him the best here kind of a sequel to Sleepless in Ponyville, with AJ, Rainbow, and Rarity going camping with their younger sisters. I think I've said it before, but yes, I know that Scootaloo and Rainbow Dash aren't related. It's just way easier for me to say whenever the CMC get teamed up with these three. Their camping trip gets interrupted when some bugs trash their campsite, so they all tell stories to pass the time. I like that they feel like actual fairy tales, with these very obvious morals, and the characters in the story even have the same elements as the older sisters. That's a cool touch. This one's okay. The CMC feel just enough 
enough out of character to make it weird, and the actual plot going on isn't too, too interesting. Okay, so now this is the one I'm going in completely blind for. Here we get to see more of the Changeling Kingdom after they've all been reformed. I didn't write this in the script, but I like how all their voices sound really dumb and nasally. I don't feel safe with him around. Thorax has this older brother who doesn't want to reform, and they gotta figure out a way to turn him good. I like the message about compromise, and that you have to find a middle ground between being a pacifist and defending yourself. Not a fan of the monster design here though, I've noticed they've been doing a lot more of these hybrid fantasy animal designs, and they just feel kinda tryhard, like... Oh, it's a giant mole bear thing, huh? Isn't that cool? Okay, this recent streak of episodes has gotten pretty rough. Dash and I forget who else, honestly. I think Fluttershy go to this village where all the ponies seem to hate Daring Do for destroying their sacred artifacts. Turns out it was all Dr. Caballeron spreading lies about her, and the two have to go on a classic Daring Do adventure to clear their name. Not too interesting. The Somnambula story is fun, with the little shake-up in the art style. Feels similar to the stories from the camping episode. Hmm, maybe that'll come back. Also, the lighting has gotten better and better here. I've noticed they've been doing different colors like yellows and greens for atmospheric parts. Watching through 9 years of MLP, you really see the improvements being made with rigged animation in general. Either that, or they're just getting more budget. Rarity's mane gets messed up on the day of a big photoshoot. Hijinx, let's just say, they ensue. I think I realize why I like the Rarity episodes the best. While I get the impression that a lot of people think she's this superficial drama queen, she actually seems to be the most chill out of all of them, even Applejack. All the things she tries to do are like real life goals, just I want to put on a fashion contest, I want to work on my business. You know, I've been missing a good slice of life one and this episode scratches that itch. It does feel a little too absurd or inconsequential, just because it's about such a physical thing and not a real relationship between characters. Rarity's mane gets messed up and instantly, like, nobody pays attention to her anymore. Feels like a Spongebob episode or something. It's kind of a nothing premise, but since I've grown attached to these characters, I really don't mind. I'm glad they can do something inconsequential. The cold opens in these episodes have been getting longer and longer. This one is two whole minutes before the theme song starts. I haven't brought this up, but I feel it lessens the impact. The idea is to give a short little thingy for the context of the episode. Examples that come to mind are Super Speedy Cider Squeezy, or Testing Testing 1, 2, 3. But here it just goes on and on. And this goes for the whole series. But they always have to have the corniest jokes before the theme song, like, Erm, that's not how you bake a cake. And then cut to Twilight Inner Balloon, like clockwork. Two episodes with Zakora in a row, wow, that's a big deal for her. Zakora gets infected by this disease, okay, immediately <laughs> taking a wrong turn, and that's gonna turn her into a tree if Fluttershy doesn't find an antidote. Eventually it affects Fluttershy, and the stakes are raised even higher. But yeah, I'm not sure Fluttershy would mind being a tree, but whatever. That's an epic brony reference if you didn't get that. They go to this bog place where they need to find this old journal by this healer lady to get this magic honey and all that. Twilight is here too, but she's not too interesting. Yeah, both Twilight and Fluttershy, I feel, got thrown under the bus way sooner than I remember. Twilight has barely any episodes in the season, and when they do do anything with her, they just have her doing the same shtick. I think the reason Twilight's gotten so bland is that she's reached the end of her studies. Twilight had this curiosity to her early on that was really endearing. Specifically, I'm thinking of the season 4 arc with the chest, and win a wrap up from season 1. Now that she's a princess and technically knows everything, the only thing they can think to do with her is just have her be neurotic or go on an adventure and have her just be like, oh wow, I can write a research paper about that, lol. Also there's another sick epic animal. I think this is my most cold take about the show, that I don't like the new animals they make up, but it just makes me roll my eyes for no reason, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I've been a little too negative. The Cutie Mark Crusaders decide to set up a Cutie Mark day camp, but this one kid decides he doesn't want to get a Cutie Mark, and turns the whole camp against the CMC. His argument is pretty much about how you're gonna get stuck doing one thing for the rest of your life, which is an interesting idea. Whenever they do explorations of Cutie Marks as a concept, it's always really interesting. And the episode itself is fine. The song feels like a dozen others from this era, just this standard jazzy musical tune with a really obvious melody. Also, the voice actor for Pipsqueak is very obviously going through puberty here and it's really funny. Blank, blank, Pretty sure this was his last appearance on the show. I mean, not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was. 
This, of all episodes, they decide to include an instrumental of the G1 theme for a bit. Weird, but cool to see it again. Twilight and her family are invited to a surprise cruise, but it turns out to be a ploy by Iron Will to market a cruiser on the princesses. It's wild how the only two plots they do with Twilight as a princess are her being nervous about princess duties or people exploiting her because she's famous now. Twi has to balance the princess stuff she's forced into with spending time with her family and eventually learns that she needs to balance work with taking time for herself. The little thing her parents put on for her at the end is cute, but this one wasn't too, too memorable. Do you guys remember that movie with John Cena where he has to like take care of the little girl and it's like a firefighter? Just bringing that up because there's a part in it where they reference this episode specifically. Why is Pinkie Pie so mad at Rainbow Dash? She found out that Rainbow Dash was secretly throwing away Pinkie's Pie so she, it was so shady and unpony I don't even want to go into it. I like how they reference this episode, yet you can clearly see the pilot playing on TV. Wow, sure hope somebody was fired for that blunder. Anyway, this one's fine. The best way to describe it, in fact, is by saying it's the kind of episode you see someone watch in another thing. Very simple, reminds me of season 1. Now if only someone would upload a rip of the Christmas episode of the show The Neighbors, where they talk about rarity and they bring in the real pony. Please, somebody, somebody know, understand what I'm talking about. Back to these knuckleheads. Sunburst comes to visit Starlight and Ponyville, but it turns out they aren't able to relate to each other too much. To make it worse, Sunburst seems to be getting along with all of Starlight's friends and not her. They even have three separate montages of Sunburst hanging out with different people, with the exact same song playing. I don't know how funny they were trying to make it, but that was the best part of the episode. You know, along with the ending, which I thought was really cute. I like the idea of Starlight having her own little squad of friends, like the main six. You know, they're all different enough from the main six, where they can stand as their own team and not some weird parallel. In general, I'm getting the impression that a lot of the character unit that they've set up from the start aren't as important now, like the main six in CMC. If anything, I'm more invested in stuff like the Apple Family or the Guy Squad or even Starlight's little gang. Here we get a payoff of this season's continuity. Not as strong as season 4's, but at least they made an effort to do some sort of gradual thing. All the stories we've been hearing throughout the season were actually real, and had their own little team of heroes who were the original main sick, led by the classic character Star Swirl the Bearded. Also returning is the Pony of Shadows, who was mentioned in like, a random season 4 episode. Twilight and co figure out how to release the Pillars of Equestria, that's what they're called, and go out to Ponehenge, ha, huh, to bring them back. They do this, but it also releases the Pony of Shadows. No, oh, no. I like that they do some fluid frame-by-frame -frame stuff when he comes back, but the Pony of Shadows is not that interesting of a character. I'd wish they'd make a new villain with, like, an actual personality. Foreshadowing! Twilight saves Star Swirl, but since the Pony of Shadows got out too, he's all mad at her, which isn't good for Twice, since Star Swirl is like her idol. Obscure unicorn history. It's so cool to see a story where Twilight actually does let someone down and has to redeem herself. They try and off the Pony of Shadows, but the main six try to forgive him, and they eventually free the guy from the darkness. Not the biggest fan of the two-parter, the Pillars of Equestria don't have too much of an impact on the show, and feel kind of messy when thrown into this season. Nothing here leads into the next, nor does it lead into the movie, which yes, is canon to the show, despite them not making any real reference to it. As a cool fantasy adventure, it's fine, and I like some of Twilight's stuff, but it's not one of the better finales. Also, this came out a few weeks after the movie, which is really weird to me. <laughs> not that it's like a bad decision, I understand that scheduling for TV and movies is different, but it's crazy to think about. Anyways, let's see that ranking. <laughs> Alright, so we're back after the movie. You can tell because we have a nice little scene in the beginning explaining all the adventures the main six went on. With the expanding of Equestria's world, Twilight gets the idea to set up a school to teach friendship to other species. I guess this is the next step for Twilight since she's already shown she can be a teacher with Starlight. I mean, 
If they're going to continue the theme of learning about friendship, I guess this is the way to do it. Now the school is a big change, but luckily we're pretty much in the home stretch for the show, so it's not a massive slap in the face. And like I just said, it fits with the themes we've already established. Everything looks good for the school, but then they introduce these bureaucrats who need to accredit it. The main one is xenophobic, so he doesn't do it. But no time for that, we have to introduce the Student Six, all made up of different species. They're not one-to-one -one with the main six, but there are a few comparisons you can make. The funny pink one, orange and blue ones who are like the tough guys, the shy one. Yona is genuinely one of the best non-pony designs here, she's really cute, yeah. Yeah, I wonder why I'd say that, I wonder who my, my son is based on. The young six get better as these seasons continue. Like, you can't expect me to have too much to say about them here, this is just their introduction. The school year starts with every creature having fun, until Twilight tries to make the curriculum more like what the Bureau wants, which makes everything boring. Moral is, the school system is dumb. The young six decide to skip class on family visiting day, and uh-oh, they cause a big mess. Chancellor Naysay revokes the school's accreditation, and thus ends our first half. Twilight fails, for real. Yeah, two specials in a row where she actually fails at something. Gives her a reason to actually feel so down in the dumps. Weird how they're doing this so late into the series. The young six are forced to go back to their respective lands, but they decide they want to stay together and hide out in the castle of the two sisters. The scene where they get attacked by these hedgehog things reminds me a lot of season one for some reason. Couldn't figure out how to explain it back then but it felt like the ponies were not at the top of the food chain. I mean, in the movie it's pretty much confirmed, but they weren't. But in season 1 and stuff, there'd be a bunch of giant monsters and dragons and all that. I don't know, it's always nice to feel some sort of actual sense of danger when watching a show like this. If Twilight doesn't return the young six members to the kingdoms, there's the threat of actual war here, which is really weird. <laughs> a lot less fairy tale ish than some of these other plot lines. They get them back and realize that, hey, we can just open the school. Yeah, no accreditation, they can just open it again and everything's fine. I get what they're doing here, but I'm pretty sure there would be a lot of things the school couldn't do if they weren't accredited. Like, I doubt that any of the friendship degrees would be actually useful anymore, nor would they get any, like, tax benefits or anything like that. I, I, I don't know, dude. Here we see the new Season 8 intro with everybody featured here, even Mod, Sugar Bell, literally everybody. I mean, nothing beats the classic intro, but at least this has more characters. This episode features Mod getting a new boyfriend and Pinkie Pie not approving. <laughs> the joke is that he's a literal stick in the mud. He likes sticks the same way Mod likes rocks. Also, he sounds like Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. Seeing Mod happy is cute, but I feel like we've seen this kind of episode before. I don't mind it too much, I get that every few seasons you need to have episodes like this to keep the characters familiar, especially after the movie. When Fluttershy takes over Rarity's shop for the day, she ends up making new personas to sell dresses to people. This one is kind of like putting your hoof down, where she tries to act different but ends up turning mean. The thing is, though, they couldn't really figure out how to make her turn mean in this one, so they just have her insulting people after a while for no real reason. It's very predictable, but that's not me saying I didn't have a fun time with it. You guys, this is the episode where she says woke. Whoa, that pony is woke. And also Flutter God. Also, we've seen this incidental pony with the blue hair and the green sweater three times with different voices. You know, just want to mention. Also, she used to have a kid. Where's the kid? Finally, the Walter White episode. Rainbow Dash wants to go to Lost Pegasus to ride this big roller coaster, but is forced to take Granny Smith and her old lady friends with her so that Applejack can cover her classes. Oh yeah, the main six are all teachers now, I forgot to mention that. Again, show growing with its audience, the student is now the teacher. Since you can't show a casino in a kid's show, Lost Pegasus is literally this weird amusement park place where they have like arcade games everywhere. Liked how Rainbow Dash ends up being too protective of them instead of wanting to do crazy stuff and have them involved. It's the opposite of what you'd expect from this kind of plot. There's a nice moral at the end about not assuming old people are incapable. I think it would have been a really nice touch if when they all rode the roller coaster at the end, to have RD scared out of her mind and the grannies are the ones actually enjoying it. But you know what? This one's really nice.
This is a thing that makes me really disappointed about these late late episodes. They get the feeling that whenever they do a song, they have to give it to the most random one-off characters. It's not that interesting because I don't care about this guy. I mean, he doesn't sing, but you get what I mean, the song's about him. At least some of the rhymes are interesting. The CMC head over to the Hippogriff Kingdom to help out this guy, who can't decide whether he wants to live with his mom in the ocean or his dad on land. And of course, the solution is dual custody. There's really nothing much to say about this one. Sweetie and Scootaloo debate on where he should live, and it was kind of fun to have them turn into sea ponies, but I don't know. I talked about it in the movie review I did, but I wish they were actual sea ponies and not these weird hybrids. The main six decide to put on a play to commemorate the anniversary of Celestia's rule. But when Celestia shows up and acts in it, they find out she's really, really bad at it. I always forget how nice her design is, it's cute seeing her here. She looks the most like an actual horse. I gotta say, it's really distracting now whenever they go to the throne room in the post-movie seasons, and you can obviously tell it's a cel shaded version of the one from the movie. Yeah, I guess that between season 7 and 8 they got it renovated for whatever reason. <laughs> Celestia finds out they think she's bad, but they make up and find a workaround. This one was cute. I really don't have too much to say about these episodes. Sunburst's mom, Oh yeah. Sunburst and Starlight go back to their old hometown and find out that their parents are fighting over what to do with all the infrastructure. Stardad wants to keep everything old and Sun Mom wants to tear everything down and build stuff over it. That's not really the point of the episode though. The real friendship problem coming in when they need to repair the relationships with their folks. It's nice. I like the architecture of the town and of course, Starlight's childhood bedroom. Bro, like the Santa Claus with starring Tim Allen? AJ and Rainbow Dash have to lead a field trip together, and they both try to outdo each other for the Teacher of the Month award. It very quickly goes the way you expect, with them competing and endangering the students, but they turn it around and have them try to act nice to each other to impress them instead. Feels like they thought the thing they do in the first half was too predictable and needed something else. It's fine. Again, not much to say. At least we get to see the young six more. I like their dynamic. It's just nice seeing people hang out. You know what? Where's the guy squad? Can we get an episode with them? Big Mac spies on Sugar Bell during Hearts and Hooves Day, but thinks that Sugar Bell is gonna break up with him. But uh oh, it was just a misunderstanding. The CMC get a little B story, and that's nice enough. Discord here is cool too. He and Spike have this little back and forth about him not believing in love. The episode's at its best when we see Spike in Discord, or all three of them, but the actual story isn't too interesting. Sugar Bell is sweet though. You know what, I forgot the ending. The ending is cute, just a little moment between Big Mac and Sugar Bell. You know what, why does Big Mac of all people have the most emotional episodes now? He's one of my favorite characters now. Spike is going through dragon puberty. He's pretty much a wreck for the whole episode, and thinks that because of it, Twilight is gonna throw him out. Kind of like Owl's World that ends well. The ending reminds me too of feeling Pinky Keen, with our heroes having to outrun this big creature. And I'm glad it's something from actual mythology and not like some goat bird or some dumb thing the character designer thought was cool. And buddy, if you thought Twilight with wings was one thing, how about Spike with wings? Yeah, y yeah. Dragon puberty eventually ends for him. Spike and Smolder have a nice dynamic, with Smolder being an older dragon who Spike can relate to. Both of them are in that middle ground between pony culture and dragon culture. They work out pretty nice. The CMC try and get into the School of Friendship because it's obviously more fun than whatever they're doing at their school. They try and prove how capable they are by tutoring this one little Pegasus pony, but of course, you can't really watch this one without knowing how the season ends. She's evil, if you haven't guessed already. I'm glad they at least did an episode like this instead of making every pony wonder what the CMC were doing, not a part of the school. In the end, they don't get in, but are hired as friendship tutors. It's a nice middle ground. Chrysalis is back, making evil versions of the main six to control the elements of harmony. 
When the main six go on a hiking trip with Starlight, Chrysalis swaps them out, and hijinks ensue. I guess I'm not too much a fan of the main six stuff they do later on because one, they barely do anything with them as a team, and two, it's never about them being friends anymore. It's like this meta thing about them teaching people to be friends, even with things like every little thing she does, or fame and misfortune. Gives the impression that all of them are just perfect as a team, which kind of goes against fame and misfortune, where they're like, oh, we're all a work in progress. The mean six here are obviously based on the season 2 premiere, where they all got discordified. Crazy that we're seeing these versions again so late in the show. Not only is it cool to see an evil Twilight, but it makes sense that the other main six members wouldn't recognize the evil versions, since they weren't there to actually see what they were like. Or whatever. You know what I mean. I mentioned earlier how cool it would have been to have an evil main six made up of villains, and I guess this is the closest we'll get to that. It's just okay. Really highlights how the main six are just kind of there now. If anything, I think the Young Six episodes are a better continuation of what the main six were like. The main six are out of school, and Starlight has to be in charge and lead the big activity for the day. But Discord shows up and acts like Discord, so now Starlight has to figure out how to get him to stop messing things up. As always, Discord is great as a character, feeling left out from the process of putting together the school and taking it out on Starlight until she says she's sorry and everything turns back to normal. This is one I think they had fun writing, like, what if Discord was in charge of the friendship school? Oh no! What I don't get is why they have these weird Disney World wristbands for the scavenger hunt. It doesn't impact anything with the plot. If they were gonna have the activity be something magical, they should have made it the main thing that Discord goes in and messes up. I mean, he messes things up during the scavenger hunt, but why is it- why do they have the wristbands? If anything, they should have just used the paper fast pass instead. Waka waka! This is the start of when we're seeing a lot, and I mean a lot more off-model faces. All I'll say for now is that you do see how far rigging has come in animation. It reminds me of things that were coming out around the time, like that Tangled show or the Netflix Carmen Sandiego. The Young Six haven't truly gotten their own episode yet, but they've had good side roles in a lot of these. Good way to get to know them, but sometimes it's just annoying. Can't give you specific scenes in this one, but I don't think Gallus or the pink one had anything to do, really. Here's the episode where we actually get to see the Young Six as main characters. One of them apparently sabotages the heart swarming decorations at the school, and now all six of them have to stay for detention until one of them confesses. While they're there, they regale each other with the different ways they celebrate the holidays. This one's sweet. I like Sandbar's story and how dumb it is, and Ocellus's bit was cute. I completely forgot what Silverstream's one was about. She's not my favorite. Yona's wasn't that interesting, and I just gotta say, you know, this is my messed up take. In a show that's about respecting other cultures, not sure how I feel about having one of them vaguely based on a real world place, and then portraying them as cartoonishly barbaric and violent. Like, the smashing is always for a joke. The joke is that they're violent. That's probably just me, but the yaks in this show probably weren't the best pick for species to keep using, if this was what they're going for. But who's to say? Turns out it was Gallus who sabotaged the thing, because he's emo and misses his friends. Aw, he does care. The Flim Flam brothers start up their own friendship school, and it turns out that they're actually accredited. Oops! To make matters worse, Star Swirl endorses it too. Wow, yeah, the whole thing revolves around Twilight, trying to expose them for being corrupt somehow. And when it looks like they're running a legitimate institution, they just find out they're scamming people. Oh, after all that time, they couldn't find the very obvious scam, okay. The whole thing they do of charging for the worksheets and textbooks is probably based on some real-life awful school thing. Also, there's a song in this one, and dude, it is nowhere near the level of the first two. If they were gonna have it be about the school, they should've leaned more into the fight song thing and not have it just be another Music Man deal. I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a little sick of the, sick of that. Okay, this is making me crazy. Apparently Rarity isn't 100% white, at least maybe on my TV or in these seasons. Anyway, she and Rainbow Dash figure out that they haven't really spent any time together lately. They try to, but it seems like they're just not friends. I don't know, it's nice that we explore the dynamic between these two, but we already had one of my favorite episodes in the series revolve around the two of them together, so I don't get the point. The shtick they do here too feels more like Rare Jack stuff. It's not that interesting. This is one that would have been better if they did it earlier on. I would have loved to see this one in like season 4, maybe 3. 
I think the problem is in general that they never really thought to do any episodes with these two. So now they're just like, oh. Pinkie Pie starts playing these yak bagpipes and ends up ruining everything for everyone. The main six agree not to tell her because they're hoping she gets better, but after more literal destruction, she doesn't. Like, just tell her she's being annoying and should practice in private. I don't get this one. And you guys, get this, at the end, she's downing a bunch of ice cream sundaes, and it's like alcohol. He's like a bartender who's like, you've had enough. Now ain't that funny and original. Wasn't like, hard to sit through, but it wasn't interesting. As much as I might say bad things about this later string of episodes, at least none of them had to have the climax of things get destroyed among all the wreckage character realizes they were wrong, blah 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 blah. It reminds me of like the first season of Amphibia, remember that? Dude, every episode they have to have a confession at the end. It's like, pop pop, I'm sorry. <laughs> Starlight and Trixie get along until they go on the road and find out that being friends with somebody is way different from traveling with somebody. I like the focus on just the two of them, but I think there are better Starlight and Trixie episodes. This one brings back the iconic Rainbow Dash fan club from Season 2, only to immediately replace it with the Washouts fan club. Who are the Washouts, you may ask? Only the most daring stunt team in Equestria. Also, the only other one we see in the entire show. That's the thing. What they're doing in this episode is fine, but the implication here is that the government-funded and run flight team is the only one worthwhile and anything else, apparently, is immediately evil and corrupt and reckless. Like if we saw some other flight teams in the show, maybe. But it's always the Wonderbolts, just weird. The whole story with Rainbow Dash and Scootaloo is cool too, but you know, I just can't watch this without thinking about how they're beating down the little guy here. We even see Lightning Dust again, this would have been an amazing episode, but man. Also more expressions. It's weird seeing the characters move like this, it's technically the same way of animating, but there's clearly a different design philosophy going into it, especially with these faces. We'll talk about them more later. The drinking through a straw bit is memorable, but I think the voice actor could have delivered it in a funnier way. I mean, you, you know, I, I couldn't deliver it in a funnier way, but may, they could, they're a professional. Dude, these episodes are boring. Boring. Rock Hoof, after being brought back, needs to find some place he can fit in today's modern world. I like how this season utilizes the school setting as much as they can. Of course, you can't have all the episodes there, but when they do, it's not just a cosmetic change. I will admit, Rock Hoof as a character grew on me. <sighs> he has a lot of fun moments. Like, <laughs> why is he wearing the sailor suit that looks nothing like the ones the hippogriffs are wearing? Was that like, <laughs> was that his idea? Yona also has some good moments. I was pleasantly surprised. The student six discover this chasm beneath the school where the spirit of the Tree of Harmony has them face all their fears. It's a neat idea, great way to get to know them better. Also because I just haven't seen anything too interesting with the main six lately. We're exploring them here in a more war-ish way compared to a slice of life thing or a random fantasy adventure. I like them as students of the main six better than Starlight too, because we see an actual group of friends and not just one singular character being like, oh sorry, I used to be a bad guy. This one was nice. We also see Cozy Glow again from earlier. Here she's more of an antagonist, pushing the young six against each other with their little microaggressions. Even at the end we have a little bit of her looking at the chasm like, ooh, what's she gonna get up to? Random thought, I would not be surprised if like brony theorists at the time thought this was Chrysalis. Seems in character, and we already saw her this season, so, you know, I don't blame you guys. AJ and Fluttershy are sent to this village of creatures who gave up their voice, because if they argue, then they turn into these fiery monsters, so they're like, hey, why don't we just not talk? It's a nice fantasy concept, and apparently these guys are from actual Japanese mythology. Wouldn't be too memorable if not for the one they meet who still talks. And she, and she talks. I understand why they'd have it like that for the story, but wow. The song is fine, probably one of the better from this era, but again, Autumn Blaze just isn't my kind of character. Same with Silverstream, or even Pinkie Pie sometimes. Like, like, we get it, you're the funny one. Dude, 
Dude, not this one. This dragon named Sludge shows up pretending to be Spike's dad. He tries to teach him how to act like a real dragon, but by that, he means tricking him into doing stuff for him. I think it's a really strong idea, Spike being coerced into doing someone's bidding by being convinced that's how dragons act, but you'd have to do it in an interesting way, and here they don't. Also, I'm pretty sure we've established that Spike is okay with acting like a pony, but whatever. Believe it or not, they sing a song together, and again, why don't the main six get any songs anymore? Also, it wasn't Spike's dad. Boy, boy, what a twist. Here we are, the season finale. When magic starts disappearing from Equestria, the main six go out and try to see if T-Rex could be causing it. While they're off visiting him in Tartarus, Chancellor Naysay comes back and takes over the school. The young six are captured and Cozy Glow reveals her true colors. I really like this two-parter. Again, with magic disappearing, it reminds me a lot of season four and how dire everything was. Also, it pays off what's been set up in the premiere, unlike last season, and plays into the rest of the show, as we're gonna see. So the main six are accidentally locked in Tartarus, and the school is under siege by Cozy Glow. I like the boarding school adventure stuff with the young six here, and the CMC get involved, which has literally never happened in these two-parters. The young six save Naysay, making him not racist, and the main six figure out a way to get out. Apparently all the combo animals have an inherent magic essence to them, so was that why there were so many lately? I don't know, I don't want to think they thought ahead that far. Another thing I really like about this was Cozy Glow's whole method of using friendship as a weapon, manipulating people and all that. It's a cool new way of looking at it. Speaking of her, they just straight up arrest this little girl at the end, it's so funny. With that, that's season 8. These past three have all had the same trend, where the beginning episodes are really solid, but then the later ones just fall off. Let's see those. Oh, psychedelic baby, more little pony season 8. Princesses Celestia and Luna are going to retire and are going to leave Equestria in the hands of the main six, but just as this is about to happen, a new villain named Grogar comes in and brings back a bunch of villains from throughout the show. Sombra defects from Grogar's team, and the main six have to stop him from taking over Equestria yet again. Feels like a return to form with the main six going on another My Little Pony adventure, TM, with Twilight as the lead. They really make a point here of how neurotic she's become. They even make up the verb twilighting, like, like wow, she brought this upon herself. I guess, but I'd be like that too in this scenario. Celestia just dumps her entire royal duties on the main six here. Not saying it's a bad thing, I mean it's good because it makes the twilighting make sense. It's much taller of an order for her than doing a magic spell or holding a festival where Sia is performing. It pretty much looks like the main six have done Sombra in, but he gets the upper hand at the last minute, meaning all of Equestria is under his control. Whenever they bring back Sombra, they don't do anything too interesting with him, but I like that they use him for one of these end-of-the-world scenarios. Don't know about his voice, though. He sounds like a weird, goofy version of James Earl Jones. Speaking of voices, throughout this entire show, they really like reusing this one straining sound effect for Twilight. I think it's from the pilot, but it's, it's the one where she goes, <laughs> Okay, our first non-two-parter focuses on the young six. After Sombra destroyed the Tree of Harmony, they try and find a way to commemorate it. But get this, they all have different ideas of what to do with it. Things get destroyed and they realize they got carried away. And then they have a clubhouse. This one's pretty okay. Glad they're at least doing this kind of premise with the young six. I know I made fun of people who complain about plots in this show being predictable, and here I am being so dismissive of the ones I think are predictable. But listen, when I act like this, it's because I've seen this kind of episode before in the same show. Not that it's a stock plot, you know, I don't care about those. I don't mind those, but when they do them again and again, it becomes not worth watching. I could just watch Castle Sweet Castle instead of this. <laughs> 
Twilight's family brings back this crown contest thing they did when they were kids, and now she and the main six have to break into Canterlot Castle as part of the contest to get it. It's a fun concept doing a heist episode, and Shining Armor immediately guessing everything they planned, and the main six having to change it on the fly. This one has some nice bits, good to see an episode that uses all the main six here, including Spike who even shows up in some of these flashbacks. I mean, you didn't need to go and animate over scenes from season 2, but do what you want I guess. Twilight has an overdue library book and worries about it. Okay, it's not immediately as bad as I thought it would be. I noticed we're getting a lot more Twilight episodes now. This one wasn't too, too exciting, but I like the focus on her. And Spike has some really cute bits here. Like the part where they go to the Indian place and he gets confused for a waiter. I wish when they went to the library and they have the portrait of Twilight, it could have been a little more exaggerated. I think if they went for like a Spongebob painting thing, it would have been really funny. The part where they go to the retirement home to find the librarian and there's all these random incidents accidental pony designs that have appeared in like Ponyville and Canterlot was weird. Like just choose different ones, not the guy from the Somnambula Daring Do episode. Patton is back with a new wifey, okay. He has this girlfriend with a kid who really likes Buckball and tries to relate to the kid, but he doesn't know anything about Buckball. It's a cute way to combine the sport with this random one-off pony from earlier on, but it's not too interesting. The daughter is voiced by an actual kid and you know, you, you can tell, um, so that might be worth mentioning. The big dance is happening at the School of Friendship. It's this big tradition in Ponyville, so Yona tries to act more ponyish in order to make an impression. But uh-oh, she and Rarity get carried away, and when the big event happens, things don't quite go as planned. Rarity has some classic post-movie season faces here. This is where they're getting really annoying. I like that they have the technology and the know-how to make more face pieces for the character rigs, but these just look kinda uncanny. The problem is not that they're doing big expressions. I need to stress. There's plenty of examples from earlier on in the show and even in some early concept art that show you can get some good expressions out of this art style. It's just the anatomy of it. There's been this general trend in the past like <laughs> 10 plus years of MLP where the ponies look less and less like actual horses and here's a prime example. The missing link between G4 and G5 here. Whenever they have these the noses look way too small and their mouths are just off center enough to where they look like they have human noses. It's gross. You know your animators were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, that they didn't stop to think if they should. Rarity got that family guy chin. Overall, this episode was really cute. What really sold it for me was the focus on Yona and Rarity, and again, they're putting the young six to good use, using them for more of these like high school plots. Again, cliche, but it's better than having things they've done before. The three remaining villains are left at the Grog Cave after Grogar is gone for the day. He tasks them with getting his magic bell so they can help him take over Equestria. They gotta learn how to work together. They sing a okay kind of version of Kidnap the Santa Claus and then go out to hike up this mountain and get the thing. I like the recharacterization of T-Rex as this big loser who's obviously compensating for something with all the magic stealing. Chrysalis is kinda there, you know, you gotta have the straight man, or, you know, woman. Or Cozy Glow I liked as a character better during her takeover in Season 8 because of how they went about it, but here they really just do the same joke with her. What if cute, but evil? Mm -hmm. Again, wasn't too interesting. I think they do have chemistry as a team though, those were the best parts of this. I would not mind seeing more of them. Also, why didn't Grogar bring back the Storm King? Was he too expensive or something? I wonder. <laughs> Spike is like, wow Smolder, your brother seems really cool, but then when they go to the Dragon Kingdom to visit him, it's Garble. Spike tries to get him to open up emotionally, but he doesn't budge until they need to warm up all these baby dragon eggs. In this episode, for some reason, they make Spike really girly. I get what they're going for, but when in the pony episodes with him, was he knitting and having talking circles or whatever? Garble is secretly like a beat poet who wears a beret and plays the bongos because, you know, very, very relevant archetype of character. I think the best part was actually Garble getting embarrassed by Spike doing all these absurdly feely things around him. And again, it was nice seeing the connection between him and Smolder, but the dragon episodes are some of my least favorite. <laughs> 
Apple Bloom wants to catch this creature that will make the apples in the orchard bloom forever, but she has to balance this with the actual harvest going on. Applejack also tried to catch it when she was a filly, and since she didn't, she and Apple Bloom have this back and forth about it. I like how they made an episode about that sense of superstition we all have as kids, where, you know, you don't know if leprechauns or the tooth fairy or Santa Claus is real, but you're trying to find out. And that's cool, and I think more media needs to, like, try and invoke that. I, you know, I don't know how, but also you gotta have some more funny faces because why not? This one's really good. Probably up there with All Bottled Up is one of the best Starlight episodes. Starlight keeps getting called back to the school during her day with Trixie, and it somehow ends up with them running around the Everfree Forest, which looks completely different here, looking for Silverstream. The whole bit at the ending was really fun. There's a bit where Mudbriar gets turned into stone and Maud likes him even more. That was really great. Maud is a highlight here for sure. This one didn't make me laugh out loud, but probably has the best jokes along with Spike at Your Service or maybe putting your hoof down, I don't know. We even see the Starlight Squad all together. This one's great. That's right, Broners, we get to see Scootaloo's parents. They finally come back to Ponyville after a big trip and announce that they're straight up leaving with Scootaloo and she's not going to see her friends ever again. Yeah, obviously they don't take it too well. The CMC try to stop this, but nothing works until they throw a big party for every pony they helped. It's one of those endings where the conflict didn't really matter because, oh wait a minute, I can just move in with my aunts. Problem solved. As a send-off episode for the Crusaders and the whole Cutie Mark conflict, I think this one is pretty good. Not send-off as in they stop, but I'm pretty sure this is our last episode, focusing on all three of them doing Cutie Mark stuff. Also, Scootaloo's aunts were a highlight. They're supposed to be a couple, but the way they did it, they obviously have Disney-style gay deniability. Like, if anyone questions it, they could just be like, oh, they're sisters-in-law. Don't know if I'd mention this, but I personally don't like when the characters in the show refer to the Crusaders as CMCs. Like, in a fandom sense, it's fine, but it just feels weird to me. This one starts with a really stereotypical main six saving the day, when Celestia and Luna come in and start doing stuff around town for every pony. Since they've been cooped up in that castle for who knows how long, they're trying to get some action before they retire. The rest of the episode just follows them going on a little vacation, and obviously, hijinks ensue. The song was really forgettable, and I didn't like what they did with Luna. Like, get it? She likes boring things, like going to the post office. Again, highlights the changing attitudes towards the princesses. They really wouldn't have done something silly like this with them in the earlier seasons. Pinkie Pie goes to Cheese Sandwich to cheer him up, since he lost his smile. He runs this factory that makes novelty gag stuff, but since he himself isn't able to see people laughing from the stuff he makes, you know, he can't smile no more. I think the concept of a factory that makes gags could have been really fun, but it just feels really childish here. Like, beyond the normal level of childish. Oh, here's where we test the rubber chickens! They don't go as whimsical with it, and I know that's the point, but it really makes it feel just kind of dumb. The Friendship School has a buckball game coming up against the Magic School in Canterlot, and with this, Rainbow Dash of all ponies is in charge of the cheer squad. But wait a minute, that's not what Rainbow Dash does. Okay, this one actually had a really nice message in the end about putting in effort even when you don't like what you're doing. Smolder also had a nice little speech, but just like Rainbow Dash, I myself didn't think the cheer stuff was all too interesting. This one starts out like a bad Spongebob episode, and buddy, you can call me Mr. Renner. Okay, for real, Twilight wants to win this trivia game and randomly gets paired with Pinkie Pie. Both Twilight and Pinkie Pie are bad in this one. Pinkie Pie has no awareness of anything going on around her, and Twilight is like this awful control freak. Also, this is probably the worst example of these faces. Every two seconds they feel the need to do it. It's like lesson zero, but at least that kept to the art style. Again, not saying they should all be rigid, but you can clearly see that there's a different way of thinking about faces here than there was early on. Even in the mid-seasons, they would have faces like these to accentuate a big reaction, but in this one, it's all the time. There are a lot of ways you could have done this one better, and the moral at the end is fine about not worrying and just learning to have fun, but this one put a bad taste in my mouth. Also, this one has a lot of weird fanfic -y moments, like Rainbow and AJ being on opposite teams and the, the wacky gags that come with that, and then all the questions just being references to lore stuff. This one has a bad energy to it. This one's cursed.
The three villains have to go to Canterlot to get a book on how to use the bell to overthrow Grogar and take Equestria for themselves. Nice seeing more of them here, but they have to split up for most of it. Also, I like how Twilight just gets over herself in the beginning and has everything under control. Each of the villains focus on a different pony race to sabotage the whole thing. Not a big plot thread as of right now, but it's gonna play super big into the finale and also weirdly bridges the gap between G4 and G5. Like, you can see that between other generations too, like 3 and 4, there are always certain things that carry over, and I guess pony racism is one of those. Fluttershy and Angel Bunny switch bodies. We get to finally hear what he's thinking, and as you'd imagine, he's not too nice. How are you gonna do your chores? Really? That's what you're worried about? This happens after Fluttershy spends the whole day working at the animal sanctuary and won't give him any attention. Hijinks, let's just say, they ensue. It's okay, but they really just don't know what to do with Fluttershy anymore. I guess it would have been character regression or whatever, but this episode would have been way more interesting if we had the more timid Fluttershy here. Here she just acts like Angel Bunny's mom. There's not enough of a contrast between their two personalities, especially in the beginning, so it just comes off as kind of boring. This one is weird because Rarity is oddly clingy to Spike, like, hey man, I just thought it was a one-sided crush, it's a little weird if it's a grown pony. Okay, not really. It's more she just wants Spike back as her confidant, or whatever. Spike starts hanging out with Gabby, the classic character, and now Rarity gets jealous and tries to hog him for herself. Now forget the trivia one, this feels like a fanfic. Okay, not only the weird Rarity and Spike thing, I bet there were a lot of weirdos who liked this episode for that, but the fact they bring Gabby of all people back and have Rarity all jealous of her, Reminds me of a, a certain story. I don't know. <sighs> Starlight's gonna become the new school headmare and with that needs to find a vice headmare to help out. They go through a few ponies but then Sunburst comes in at the end episode over. Also, Trixie is here for the whole thing messing things up for the school, until Starlight eventually just makes her the guidance counselor. This one has some more faces, but you know, at least they look kinda cute. Okay, so get this. Instead of Dr. Caballeron and the big monster from Daring Do being evil, it was all just a misunderstanding. Caballeron writes a book slamming Daring Do, so Artie and Fluttershy have to go confront him. Leads into an adventure where they all just sit down and have a conversation. I'm not gonna get into all the lore stuff and how little sense it makes. You know, that's for Patton Oswalt to do, but unfortunately he doesn't show up here. The CMCs want to go to the fair, but since the adults are out of commission, they're just gonna have to stay behind, until they find a magic flower that makes them grow up instantly. It's that kind of plot where they realize that growing up is about maturing on the inside, as well as out. They have a big action scene too, not much to say. We are in the home stretch right now, I just want to get to that finale. But at least this is an episode with the CMC as kids where they don't act all wide-eyed like the Campfire Stories one. Guy Squad episode, okay, based. Big Mac tries to propose to Sugar Bell, but things, erm, um, don't go quite as they planned. Big Mac is going to propose to Sugar Bell, Sugar Bell, Sugar Bell. <laughs> They have these weird total drama confessionals here. Don't know why they really had to go with that. Anyways, this one's really sweet. The wedding scene at the end with the tree from the perfect pair was nice. Probably one of the best lead-ins they could have done to the actual finale finale. Wraps up a lot of stuff. Including Big Mac's character arc. Like, like the silent character arc they give Big Mac here is, is crazy. Just in time for Twilight's coronation, the three villains get the power from Grogar's bell and eventually turn on him, who turns out to be Discord in disguise. So, okay, throughout this whole season, he's secretly been testing the main six, bringing back Sombra as well as these three, you know, with the idea that he can just poof them out of existence if they win. But guess what? Discord immediately gets all the power sucked out of him. They go on to attack the castle, and the princesses lose their power. Main six get kidnapped, and Twilight goes missing, escaping trying to find out how to beat the three. I think the reusing of these three was okay, having villains who now work together and not just one bad guy, but I think they could have pushed it more. Again, villain main six would have been crazy, or maybe just a new character or characters. I get that they wanted to better define characters' personalities like T-Rex or Chrysalis, but it makes the world feel a little small. But again, you could say that it's better than just having some villain from out of the blue show up for this season and this season alone.
Thanks to the villains, every pony is racist now. The main six hatched one final plan to defeat the villains, and they just go after them in a field. I remember this finale lasting longer when I saw it before, but hey, it's still cool. I thought it was funny when they go and beat the bad guys, the A team is made up of the more marketable of the main six, with the others and Spike being the B team. They have an endgame moment at the end where every creature comes back, and that's the finale. Well, not yet. This two-parter did all it needed to, really, brought back enough old stuff, as well as giving the main six one last big adventure. I think it would have been cool to parallel the first two-parter more, but we're actually gonna see that with the last episode. Huh. This one is going to make me cry, just like the Sonic Archie comics. We flash forward 20 years where Twilight is the sole ruler of Equestria, with the main six as her friendship council. There's this one unicorn who doesn't want to learn about friendship, so you know exactly what Twilight's gonna say about that. Like the last two, this one did what it needed to. I'd honestly be surprised if they didn't try some sort of time skip showing us where all the characters were, and you know, which couples would be endgame, Oh yeah. Looks like Apple Dash and Cheese Pie people really won here. Also, Discord shows up, but doesn't talk. I wonder why. I think the one thing they fumbled the ball on is that we don't see enough of the CMC, or I don't think we see them at all actually. Let me. Okay, we do, but you know, not enough. The flashback to Twilight's coronation is nice enough, I guess. I like this as a finale. It's pretty chill, and I much prefer it to the idea of tacking this onto a two-parter. I feel like a lot of it was engineered for old fans coming back for this final one, like them not relying too much on lore, and just having a really simple main six story, having it be one part, not too much action. Anyways, I like it. It was the right thing to do to end the show. Also, did I mention that Chad Spike is back? Chad Spike is back. They have this line after the coronation thing about it being the end of an era, and they're all like, well, whatever's next will be even better. And that just makes me, you know, it makes me sad. You guys, the pony show is over. No more ponies. It's longer than any other version by far. You know, if you don't count how the original 80s toy line ran for like 13 years. Simpler expressions and the way characters like Twilight and Fluttershy were written gave it a lot of charm. The overall art style started out beautiful. But you could also argue that the later seasons have things to offer that are better than the first three or even four. Technically better animated and a few more nuanced characters, detailed backgrounds, locations. Each season or era has a lot of great episodes, but it also has ones that weren't all too fun to watch. I will admit my bias that I do have a lot of nostalgic connection to the first four seasons, but the later ones have some of my favorite episodes. The worst things they did were some of those switch ups they tried in the season finales. I get you gotta keep it fresh, but those seem to have alienated fans the most, but what do I know? Another factor I want to bring up is it depends on which characters you like, which episodes you like. There ain't a lot of Thorax or Pinkie Pie episodes near the top of the ranking, just letting you know. But with that, let's get on to it. The final ranking, every My Little Pony episode. Fame and Misfortune, A Trivial Pursuit, It Ain't Easy Being Breezies, Yakety Sacks, The Fault in Our Cutie Marks, Dragon Quest, Sweet and Smoky, The One Where Pinkie Pie Knows, Triple Threat, Surf and or Turf, Baby Cakes The Last Laugh, Every Little Thing She Does, The Crystalline Part 1, one, the Crystalling Part 2, She Talks to Angel, Uprooted, Non-Compete Claws, The End and Friend, Common Ground, Fluttershy Leans In, Daring Doubt, Campfire Tales, Not Asking for Trouble, Daring Dawn, Friendship University, Bird in the Hoof, Horseshoe In, The Times They Are a Changeling, Wonderbolts Academy, Read It and Weep, To Change a Changeling, Top Bolt, Mystery on the Friendship Express, Bridal Gossip, Party Pooped, Flutter Brother, Viva Las Pegasus, Marks for Effort, A Friend Indeed, PPOV, Pony Pony View, Newbie Dash, Brotherhood Social, Lesson Zero, Growing Up It's Hard to Do, Marks and Recreation, Rainbow Falls, The Washouts, 246 Great, Between Dark and Dawn, A Health of Information, Daring Don't, Too Many Pinkie Pies, Tradia, Buckball Season, Celestial Advice, School Days Part 2, School Days Part 1, The Mean Six, The Last Crusade, Once Upon a Zeppelin, Applejack's Day Off, the Parent Map, Cutie Map Part 2, Frenemies, The Cart Before the Ponies, The Summer Sun Setback, Stranger Than Fiction, Appaloosa's Most Wanted, Sparkle 7, Hurricane Fluttershy, A Matter of Principles, May the Best Pet Win, Dragon Drop, Shadow Play Part 1, Shadow Play Part 2, Stairmaster, Discordant Harmony, Going to Seed, A Flurry of Emotions, The Mod Couple, Gauntlet of Fire, School Race Part 1, School Race Part 2, Uncommon Bond, Secrets and Pies, Swarm of the Century, To Wear and Back Again Part 1, Molt Down, The Cutie Map Part 1, A Royal Problem, Rock Solid Friendship, Some Pony to Watch Over Me, Flight to the Finish, The Beginning of the End Part 1, The Beginning of the End Part 2, Games Ponies Play, 
Parental Guidance, Just for Sidekicks, On the Road to Friendship, Sounds of Silence, Bloom and Gloom, The Breakup Breakdown, Horseplay, Mod Pie, No Second Francis, The Fields and the McColts, Party of One, On Your Marks, Sonic Rainboom, The Mysterious Murderwell, Call of the Cutie, Fake It Till You Make It, Cutie Mark Chronicles, The Hearts Warming Club, 28 Pranks Later, Equestria Games, Gift of the Mod Pie, Last Roundup, Keep Calm and Flutter On, Bats, To Wear and Back Again Part 2, The Cutie Remark Part 1, The Cutie Remark Part 2, What About Discord, Pinkie Pride, Forever Philly, Dungeons and Discords, What Lies Beneath, Hearts Warming Eve, Testing Testing 1, 2, 3, Make New Friends But Keep Discord, Crystal Empire Part 1, Crystal Empire Part 2, Hard to Say Anything, Ending of the End Part 2, Ending of the End Part 1, The Point of No Return, Griffin the Brush Off, Princess Twilight Sparkle Part 1, Princess Twilight Sparkle Part 2, The Showstoppers, Made in Manhattan, The Big Mac Question, Green Isn't Your Color, One Bad Apple, All's Well That Ends Well, Spice Up Your Life, Do Princesses Dream of Magic Sheep, Castle Sweet Castle, Granny's Gone Wild, Canterlot Wedding Part 1, Canterlot Wedding Part 2, Sleepless in Ponyville, Castle Mania, She's All Yak, Rock Off in a Hard Place, Honest Apple, Twilight Time, Over a Barrel, Leap of Faith, Dog in a Pony Show, Luna Eclipse, Heartbreakers, The Super Speedy Cider Squeezy 6000, The Return of Harmony Part 1, The Return of Harmony Part 2, Feeling Pink and Keen, Secret of My Excess, The Saddle Row Review, Friendship is Magic Part 1, Friendship is Magic Part 2, Ghostbusters, Three is a Crowd, The Lost Treasure of Griffinstone, Slice of Life, Hearts and Hooves Day, Amending Fences, Tanks from the Memories, Winter Wrap-Up, For Whom the Sweetie Belle Toils, Crusaders of the Lost Mark, Rarity Takes Manhattan, It Isn't the Main Thing About You, Sweet and Elite, Sisterhood Social, The Best Night Ever, Suited for Success, Apple Buck Season, Putting Your Hoof Down, Dragon Shy, The Main Attraction, It's About Time, Canterlot Boutique, Philly Vanilli, The Last Problem, Princess Spike, Twilight's Kingdom Part 1, Twilight's Kingdom Part 2, The Ticketmaster, A Heart's Warming Tale, Pinky Apple Pie, Fall Weather Friends, The Cutie Pox, The Perfect Pair, Magical Mystery Cure, All Bottled Up, Student Council, Where the Apple Lies, Spike at Your Service, Scare Master, Apple Family Reunion, Inspiration Manifestation, Simple Ways, Ponyville Confidential, Power Ponies, Family Appreciation Day, Magic Duel, Rarity Investigates, and Look Before You Sleep. I know, predictable. Alright, video over, go home. Okay, but nah. There will never be another show quite like MLP. It came during a drought of simple animated comedies, at a time where online fandom culture was launched into relevance. Right now, it's something that's nostalgic to the people who grew up with it, and to the people who were grown-ups with it. Like I said, it crossed generational boundaries. In around 2013 to 2014, MLP was the biggest it's ever been, and that's because of the fun characters and setting, I think. So now, in a new decade, what could Hasbro possibly do to top it? Yeah, I'm talking about the IDW comics people. Those are still going on to this day. But with that, I hope you enjoyed the video. And of course, a shout out to my fans on Patreon. HBM, Skambuli, Asafrani, Hoodie, The Fox's Raven, Nana, Jesse Ball, I've Got Frostbite, Kaylee Lahoda, Rosa, Grimma Merc, Shade Walker, Knife Girl, The Blazing Pegasus, Jason Ferguson, Technicolor, Jack Getchman, Paisley, Gunner Clovis, Mavis Likes Bugs, Trixie Best, No, Yak Best, Olive, Knightley, SR Nano, Gator Kitty, Alex Kincaid, Dashi, A Kawaii Dragon, Keaton Cryer, Cascadiarch, Bad Bessie, Damian, Booth Taste, Marsh Marlow, Madzia, and Goose Dog. I can't think of a better outro, so until next time, goodbye.